We don't have to fight We don't have to kill Everybody in the whole wide world Really just needs to chill No, we don't Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Just Chill with Oliver George. This is episode 97. I'm very excited about the guest I have in studio with me. If you're a fan of Canadian comedy in the early 2000s, you might recognize him. But since then, he's been on a very different path towards spiritual enlightenment. Before we get into it, though, I do want to remind you, if you are watching on YouTube and you would prefer audio only, you can get that on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, and other places like that. If you're hearing my voice on one of those platforms, though, and you didn't realize that there was a visual side to this show, I encourage you to please come check it out here on YouTube. If you do come over to this side of things, I would really appreciate it if you would hit that subscribe button. You obviously do not have to do that, but it really does help me to keep growing this channel and I love connecting with new people. So if you're just stopping by for the first time or you've been watching for a while now, thank you so much for the support. It really means a lot to me. If you'd like to reach out to me, maybe you've got a cool guest idea or some general feedback about the program, you can hit me up on social media or send me an email at justchillpodcasting at gmail.com. While you're doing that, let me know if you have interest in one of these holofoil stickers with the show's logo on it, and I'll mail you one free of charge. Uh, We also need to mention we've got the 100th episode. We're doing a live 100th episode at Yuck Yuck's West End location here in Ottawa. We've got Derek Sege coming out for that, Christina Muehlberger, and a couple of other great guests. So, uh... I'll be sharing all that on social media as soon as we have the link up should be sometime very soon and you'll be able to purchase tickets before you know it. So keep your eyes peeled for that. Now back to the guest, the man of the hour, as I often say, as I mentioned, if you were uh, watching the comedy network in the early aughts, you might recognize him as Mr. Mo, one half of the comedic duo Buzz. But since then, he's been on a totally different path towards Spiritual enlightenment, as I said, and he has developed his own meditation practice called Yinergy, which is very, very interesting, and I'm very excited to learn a lot more about it. He has a brand new book called Bodhi in the Brain, and I'm very, very glad you're here. Nice to meet you. Morgan O. Smith. Pleasure, pleasure. Thank you for having me, Oliver. Thanks for coming out. I just want people to know that my middle name is Oliver. I I just noticed that today, and I thought that was a little bit of a cool coincidence. Me too. Yeah, his middle name is Oliver. That's why mine is. Yeah, cool. Although you never go by Brian O. Maybe you should try it. Brian, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks again. Where are you coming from? Toronto, I'm guessing? Yeah, from Toronto. Okay. Yeah. Were you born and raised there? Uh, I was born in Jamaica. In oh, Kingston, cool. Jamaica, but came to Canada when I was about nine months old. At the time, I was living in, as far as I was told, I was living in London, Ontario. And then uh, at some point came to the Toronto area and then moved about from Toronto to Brampton, from Brampton to Scarborough. And Scarborough for a very long time, and then to town of Markham, and then uh, all the GTA kind yeah, of area, pretty much. Okay, yeah, yeah. And yeah I didn't catch a there. Jamaican accent on you, so you no. must have not been there long <laughs> enough. You go back there sometimes. You have family there. Um, I'm going back there uh, to for a friend's wedding in December, actually, of this year. Awesome. But I haven't been back since I was like 12. Oh wow, that's yeah. amazing. Then yeah. I went there uh, 2016. It was the first. Sorry, call. 14. 13, 14 is so the last time. Oh, 12. I can't remember. <laughs> well, it's been a long time, though. Yeah. yeah. It'll, that should be really I cool. Believe to was, I believe it was 12. Yeah. Yeah, I went uh, one once and only, but it was really, really beautiful. I'm trying to remember. Uh, Montego Bay is Yeah, where Montego we Bay. Yeah, yeah, it was a really great time. We went on this excursion up to, like, Bob Marley's. Uh, it was, like, the rock he used to oh, yeah? meditate on. And okay. And they've got his... Uh, body presumably in this like mausoleum type thing you can mm. go in and smoke a joint next to it oh, if yeah? you want to okay. yeah it's that very, I know. Okay. yeah it was pretty gnarly honestly it was uh, and you get to see a different side obviously when you leave the resort and see the true jamaica the mountains and yeah really really the cool way it stuff. actually the way it actually is yeah, yeah exactly yeah. not the Jamaica's commercial beautiful. side oh it is definitely yeah, i'd love to go back beautiful. there well, okay. So uh, I did want to know sort of about your early life because obviously you went into the, the comedic world as you got older. I wanted to know, were you always kind of a joker or how did that come about? How did you fall into comedy? Well, um, I grew up in a Christian with a Christian background. Uh, my father is a church minister. Well, he's now a church b- bishop. Okay. But um, at the time, I actually I remember him even before when I was born. Yeah. But even before he was even involved in that. So as time went on in my early ages, he started going to church, um, and eventually became a pastor and, and all that. So I grew up in that environment pretty much, uh, as time went on, of course, uh, uh, as I got older, there were moments where I would make my family laugh, like just dealing with, uh, harsh situations that we were going through. And I was just good at making uh, making fun out of it, making Breaking jokes that out of it. Breaking that tension a bit. Yeah. Yeah, okay. And, you know, I always heard, that, oh, you should try doing comedy or something at some point. 
um, which I found out now they didn't actually, they didn't actually mean it, but, <laughs> <laughs> but that, that inspired me to want to want to try it. So as, as time went on, uh, by the time I was, uh, 22, I tried it for my first time. Like you're talking stand up, actual stand up. Oh, nice. Yeah, for the cool. Very I was going to ask you if you ever did stand up. Oh yeah, I did stand up for twelve years. Oh damn. Yeah, so I, as I was doing a buzz, I was doing stand up the whole time. When's the last time you did it? Last time I did stand up was two thousand and six. Are you ever going to get out there again? You think or no? I don't have the motivation. <laughs> well, that's fair. Yeah, if you're not feeling it. <laughs> yeah, I don't have the motivation, but um, I still teach it. Okay, cool. Yeah, I still teach it. So even even till now. Uh, if I'm sure you know Kenny Robinson. Yes, yes. Yeah, Kenny Robinson. I don't know him personally, but I'm very aware of his... Uh, you should have him on the show one day. But uh, I'd love to, yeah. yeah we, I assisted him uh, with his comedy uh, workshop last year for about six months. That's awesome. And then this year, just uh, we just ended it. Uh, I assisted uh, Ronnie Edwards in his comedy workshop. That name, I don't know. Oh, no? no uh, I don't think so. If you look up Kenny, you should find Ronnie Edwards as well. They were a pair. They, they had um, a thing together called uh, Thick and Thin. So they were the first to make funny. the, they made the first black uh, sketch comedy uh, pilot in Canada, in history of Canada. Oh, wow. So there was the two of them that, that made that particular What was it called? Uh, project, you know? Thick and Thin. Oh, Thick and Thin. That was yeah, the name of it. Yeah, it's my Thick bad. and Thin is the name of the actual I thought that was, uh, that was their stage name or something. It, um, it, it could have been. It was their shtick. Okay. At that time. So I guess they took that and made that into a TV show. And uh, they came out with um, a sketch pilot uh, back in, gosh, I can't remember what year it was, but 90, gosh, 96, 97, maybe. Okay. And it was, uh, it was aired on, uh, on CBC. Did, and, it, yeah. did it get greenlit though, the series or no? No, it didn't. Oh, but, uh, but I was fortunate enough to get a spot in it. So, cool. <laughs> so back you in those on YouTube days, or? You have to. I don't know. I'm going to look it up. I have to, I have yeah, to look it up. Curious. But yeah, I, I actually don't know. I actually don't know. Um, but years later, it led to uh, Kenny came out with um, his own sketch comedy show on the Comedy Network, which, which was called After Hours. That also sounds familiar. Yeah, if you look up that, you'll find that. I'm okay. sure you'll find clips of that on YouTube. Yeah, I used uh, to watch Comedy Network all the, all time. the time. That was right? my bread and butter. Yeah. yeah, I was like a teen probably during Buzz. Well, yeah, I was born in 85. So 85, when Buzz right? was on from 2000 to 2005, I think. Actually, longer than that. Longer than that. For for for, for the Comedy Network, it was like from uh, 2000 to 95, because I finished. Or 2005. I, sorry, 2005. Okay. Because I, I stopped. I, I, I finished my, our last few episodes in 90, sorry, in 2004. Okay. Yeah. So, but, but we oh, started. Oh, you were on basic cable before that, yeah, though, right? Yeah. For, okay. for, for three seasons. Wow. Yeah, Rogers, three seasons. Uh, just like Tom Green style, I guess. Uh, Tom, yeah. yeah. Tom Green. So Tom Green was doing his thing here in Ottawa and we were doing our thing in Toronto. And when he went to MTV, that's when you guys got picked up for the Comedy Network? Yeah. Well, when he went to MTV, because he was under the production company MTR. Okay. So when he went to MTV, MTR needed a replacement. So that's when um, they were listening to an interview uh, with uh, Sarah Polly. Okay. And so they were asking, someone was asking Sarah Polly what's her, like, what she's into these days, what's her favorite show. So at the time, she said her favorite shows were uh, Tom Green and, and Buzz. So there you go. MTR oh, said, well, who's this, this Buzz show? We've never heard of it. So they did some research. They found uh, what it was and uh, who was involved. And they looked this up. We had some meetings and then uh, we made a deal and then they uh, sold us over to the, uh, signed us over to the comedy network. That's awesome. Yeah, that's and you were on longer than I thought, actually, because thinking back, I thought it was on for like two or three years. I didn't realize oh, it was longer on for than five. That. Yeah. Uh, or yeah. even more with the cable with stuff. With the cable stuff. Yeah. So nine seasons altogether. Yeah. Wow. I, I also have to say, when I was doing research for this, I could have sworn it was called The Buzz. But do, do you get that a lot where people <laughs> mix that lot. up? Yeah. yeah, okay. yeah. And at one point, we were going to call it The Buzz mm. um, because it was some legal stuff that happened and um, once we went over to the Comedy Network. So we were, it was Buzz, and then we were going to change it to The Buzz. And then we're going to change it to Buzz TV, and none of that worked for us. So we just kept it as Buzz. Short and simple. So short and simple. Yeah, yeah. So is that how you met stuff. Darren Jones? Was doing stand up? I met him through. I met him while doing stand up. So I met Darren Jones the very first time he did stand up. I think he was about sixteen at the time, probably sixteen. That's young. Yeah, at the time, and uh, I, I met him at the comedy club. I met him at Yuck Yucks. We had a conversation, uh, and then he came back th uh, a week later, and then he disappeared for about a year. So a year later, he came back to do stand up again, and at that point, we started to do. Um, we we were filming for Buzz, but we needed another host. So uh, you know, we got ah. Darren involved in that, and that's how we became a duo. Okay, I was assumed you guys created it together, but you already had it kind of no, up and running. Buzz, Buzz was actually based on an old Rogers show called Street Beat or something like that. I think it was called Street Beat. That also sounds familiar. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. Maybe I'm I'm crazy, but I could have sworn I heard of that. Yeah, it's an old show on Rogers. Uh, so that's what it was based on. So at the time. Uh, I was the host and the producer, Mike McKinnon, uh, he played as the mock co-host. 
because we needed a, a, a another host. Yeah. We needed a body. So we aired an episode without Darren. And so after that, Darren heard about it or saw it on, on Rogers and he contacted me, asked how he can get on the show. I said, you know what, call Mike because he knew Mike as well. So um, And Mike didn't really want to be a permanent co-host in no, a big way? He, no. he just wanted to do the the producing, the the, the camera work and all that stuff. Okay. That's, what he, that's what he does. So he just had to fill in because we needed two people. And the person that we wanted originally didn't pan out for whatever reason. So... Um, so Darren slid in there. Yeah, he, he, he got in there. He, uh, Mike took him out for some, like a, a, some, some form of an audition. He, he killed it, and then that's how we became the duo. So what we did was we took the, old, the first episode that was airing on Rogers and we re-edited Darren into that episode. So oh, he's crazy. there from the very beginning. <laughs> but there was an episode that aired where like he wasn't retcon, in. like a retcon, yeah. Yeah, and it, that's, what, that's how it became Buzz. Very cool. Wow. Okay. Yeah, I didn't know there was so much history there. That's a, lot, a lot of history. There's a lot of things people don't know of what, uh, how the show came about. We even got to the point when we aired the first episode, we almost got canceled. Yeah. For content? For content. So we almost got canceled. What was they were the trying cancelable to pull content? I can't remember. Oh, no, it didn't even <laughs> so long ago. That bad. <laughs> Not to me. Yeah. yeah it was, but it was, um, what we, th- we, we got to keep in mind was public access, right? And this so, is a long time ago. It's a long too. time ago, yeah, right? Yeah. We're talking about the 90s. Many boundaries hadn't been crossed with hasn't like been jackass crossed and people like that. <laughs> yeah. And there were certain boundaries that Tom Green hasn't, hadn't crossed yet at that time. Yeah. So something, we did something. I can't remember what it was. And uh, they were trying to pull us off, off the air. And then we were able to save it somehow. I guess uh, someone vouched for it. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you this, which is something a lot of people don't know. Um, the original associate producer of the show, if I have the title right, was, uh, if you remember, Ed the Sock. Yeah, yeah. The guy who plays Ed the Steve Sock, Kersner. Steve Kersner. He's been on the show, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, no, was, Ed the Sock has been on the show. The Sock, the Sock has been on the show? <laughs> yeah, but he was the producer. He was the associate producer of the show. I definitely didn't know that. That's yeah. very cool. Yeah, and then he left Rogers. And so... so Probably before he left Rogers, he probably fought on, uh, on behalf of the show or something that maybe I kept that part. I don't, I don't remember, but someone saved it. Yeah. He's very anti-censorship and, uh, for sure. Yeah. That's for sure. Yeah. He's yeah. an outspoken. So it may have been sock. him that saved it. Yeah. It may have been him that saved it. I just can't remember the story. Uh, and then, uh, we were able to, uh, continue with, with more episodes. Yeah. That's cool. I like that connection there. And we should say to my audience, if they've never seen the buzz or buzz rather, sorry, <laughs> um, that you guys were sort of like a guerrilla style comedy. You go out on the street, on the street and just do crazy mess with stuff people, and, pranks yeah, and did uh, tiny skits in between and just, you know, it was in and, that era of Tom Green and Jackass and that kind of that was right. really on the rise at the yeah. time. Um, well, do you have any favorite memories from making that show? Maybe favorite skits or just favorite happenings? And also, Tons. is there any you regret, any skits you wish like you could kind of redact from existence? There are skits that I regret. That haven't aged only well because, Only because, but the ones I regret haven't aired. No, no, sorry, I take that back. Uh, one that I regret did air, but it wasn't supposed to. Oh. Something, uh, I'm not even going to get into it because I'll get angry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But, but uh, something happened where we... I don't want to bring we, up old wounds. I know. Uh, yeah, you don't want to do that, right? But uh, something happened where uh, we, taped, uh, um, we, we taped a couple of things, which I just wasn't comfortable with. And I, 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 and I mentioned, we can't air this. I mentioned that. And I'm sitting at home months later, uh, turn on the TV to watch <laughs> an episode of Buzz, and my mouth dropped. And I was like... Oh no! I'm not even going to say what it was, but I—I no, I was so you tell me off pissed. The air that, it's, it's, that's going to bother me. Yeah, I was so pissed, and, uh, but we couldn't remove it. But um, yeah, that that. But other than that, um, I can't think of anything that I actually regretted. No, because, well, that's because, good. Yeah. But any like yeah. favorite moments from the whole tenure that you had on that show? There, is, there's a lot, there's a lot of them. Um, like the country modi stuff. Um, there are some moments like uh, where there was a character we used to do called Ku Klux Clown. <laughs> I used to love doing that character. Uh, it was it brought a lot out of me. But um, uh, we had some situations, uh, uh, con- uh, controversial situations that happened doing that character, like trying to tape it. Mm. It's the hardest thing ever because we weren't clan outfits, right? So People don't know it's a farce. <laughs> yeah, they take it seriously. Yeah, they really take it seriously. So um, one R- time, rightfully sh- so. I rightfully say, so. Yeah. Right. It's a good thing. It brings tears to my eyes of tears of joy knowing that it bothers people. Give people. A shit. Yeah, people yeah. Should, should be bothered by it, right? But they didn't understand. Um, you know, the parody behind it. So um, satire, everybody relax. Yeah. <laughs> but there was one time that we uh, had to shoot, we needed space and we had to shoot the character, the, the, the segment. So we decided that we, to shoot the segment at, uh, at CTV and whoa, I'll never do that again. <laughs> oh, why? <laughs> um, no one was warned about what was about to take place. And they just saw 
a, a guy in a clan outfit because I'm in a clan a clown outfit. It makes sense what I'm doing uh, in the makeup and everything like that. But the other guy, uh, it was a full out clan outfit. <laughs> so, you were just the clown of the clan. I was the clown of the clan. So people's like, okay. I understand. Well, what's that guy doing there? So it caused a lot of stir. Um, I can imagine. But at, at the time, you know, being young and foolish, that, that was the funniest thing to me. Um, now when I look back at it, I'm like, huh, damn. <laughs> that was kind of <laughs> but um, that was that was one incident. Another another incident was um, we try to do that that um, that segment again. Well, different segments, same characters in Hamilton, and we got chased out of there. They thought it was an actual clan rally. So uh, we got chased out of there. And but again, that's kind of beautiful. In a that's way, a beautiful right? thing. Yeah. I'm running and I'm like, this is great. This is <laughs> You're like, I agree this is progress. With you. I'm with you. <laughs> so that was in, and that, and actually uh, when we won the Gemini award back in 2001, um, the episode that was, uh, that was um, nominated and won, uh, it was actually in that episode. So it was an edited version of what happened that day. But truthfully, what happened, we got chased out of Hamilton that day. So <laughs> that was a memorable moment. Um, yeah, but I don't regret it. Yeah, no, that, that sounds like some, yeah, some that great was, yeah. experiences. Yeah, it, it allowed us to experiment and try new things and uh, throw things out there. And uh, I, had a, I had a blast uh, doing it. And we had some down moments too, of course. But uh, there were some moments where I was just like, oh, I'm glad. It, yeah, I'm, I'm glad this panned out. And, and you guys traveled at one point, right? Oh, yeah, did we did a lot of travel overseas. Yeah, overseas, Germany, um, uh, um, Netherlands. The UK, uh, we I went think. To, we went to, yeah, we went to England. Uh, yeah, uh, New York. I mean, that right there is already oh, yeah. an amazing experience, just getting to go and see different parts of the world, parts while, of the world while getting paid and making a show. Yeah. That's yeah. And the other half of that was just going um, across Canada and just shooting segments in different provinces and cities and stuff. Oh, so like you've that, probably really been cool. everywhere in the country? Been to every province, except for one... How many territories do we have? Three now, Three? because of Nineveh. Okay, so. so all the provinces, except for two of the territories. Yeah. 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 So that's about, yeah. That's understandable so, though. Yeah. It's pretty damn cold. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it was fun. It was, it was a blast. Um, just to, uh, of course, some of these places I've been to from doing stand up because you know, I did stand up for 12 years. So even as while we're doing the show, I was still doing stand up and, and doing Finding spots stuff. here and there. Cool. Oh yeah. And so how did the show come to a close? Was this something you guys opted out of? Like we're done, we've done all we want to do, or was it just canceled at one point? No, we, we, we got together with the comedy network after doing the, um, how many seasons did we did? I thought I read five online, but no, I think we did six seasons. Maybe it was. Yeah, I think it was six seasons. Yeah, if I have that right, because we did three with Rogers, and yeah, I think it was six with with Comedy Network. So okay. uh, after the fifth season, I hope I have that right. After the fifth season, we had a meeting with the Comedy Network, and we just got together and we said, I, I just they were saying, I just don't see how. Do you have more content? <laughs> and I was at the point where I was like, I, I think, I think we got it. I think that's, yeah, out. I think that's it. I think we, we got enough. And so we made the decision to, to, to do one more season, season, which I believe was the, was the sixth season. And that was it. Go out on a high note though. Yeah. yeah. You don't want yeah, to be like puttering 13. around at the end, trying to come up with ideas. Yeah. Just coming up with ideas and, and stuff feeling like it. Yeah. The last two years was kind of difficult trying to come up with new stuff. So, but yeah. yeah and we just made that decision. And, um, I think it was the last episode cause I haven't seen um, the last two seasons. Oh, I haven't watched a lot. Yeah, I've never seen them in my oh. life. So. <laughs> is there anywhere to watch the show is what I was wondering. I don't even know. <laughs> I found little clips on YouTube, but they were all grainy, like taped from a VHS or something, you know? I no, there, there was, um, th uh, there was a guy I knew. He was a manager at a strip joint. That's, that's <laughs> what I remember. Um, we were good. We were friends. Uh, he hit me up and he says, hey, I found a link to your show. Someone downloaded all the episodes onto oh, YouTube. Like an archive. Yeah, and I I watched one of the episodes that I haven't seen that I, that I that I haven't seen. I didn't see the rest, but I think they were all there. I just couldn't remember uh, what it was under because it wasn't under Buzz or anything like that. It's mm. probably still there. I'm I just search, I just can't yeah. remember. Yeah, I just can't remember um, uh, the, the what he gave me. But I remember looking it up that day and say, "Oh gosh, the episodes are here." But there are many episodes. There's. Um, yeah, how many episodes I haven't even watched? Like at least twenty six episodes I haven't seen. You would think that after this long, that would be a really fun thing to go back and do, no? Or you've just kind of moved on from that. You don't really. If it pops up, I'll, I'll take a look. Because there's some, there's certain, there's certain segments that I did. I wish I was able to to see. Yeah, yeah there goes. There was some. Um, gosh, there was a there was a country mo song that I did. I've never seen. It was. Um, I think it was called "I Need a Blow." <laughs> <laughs> i've never seen that video so <laughs> if anyone out there yeah. has it please send, send it over link. yeah we'll put it yeah. up in the, in the episode yeah, or, or something because i've never seen it so uh, there's quite a yeah there's a number of them i haven't seen yeah 
That's so cool. Well, hopefully they're out there and we can track them down. <laughs> track down these episodes. And yeah, so cool. one thing I got to know is, are you and Darren still friends? You guys yeah, we're still, still communicate? Here's the thing. I haven't seen Darren since 2004. No way. Yeah, because it was a segment uh, that we had to reshoot. Um, either, oh, it's not that we had to reshoot it. It's, we just couldn't get the two of us together. Mm. Uh, because he was busy doing his other his, his other um, uh, projects, so we couldn't. He couldn't. Mike wasn't able to get the two of us together at, at that time. So we ended up shooting an intro to a segment months later. So this is now the, the last seasons. The last season was airing at this point. So he had to get the two of us together to shoot this this intro for this segment that was already shot. So that was the last time I saw Darren. I remember him coming over to my place. We went on the road to, to shoot the segment, and that was it. But I have spoken to him quite a few times throughout the years. Oh, so you're still communicating, just not in person. Just not in person. Okay. Yeah. We're, we're supposed get... to meet up one point. We're, we're also, real th- at one point, we're thinking about um, trying it out again for at least, yeah. That would be amazing. But, um, lost contact with couldn't find Darren for that for that meeting so oh, that's uh, so and after that we just they like, just dropped the whole thing so but the last time I spoke to Darren gosh that was probably about uh pre-pandemic two years ago yeah oh. pre sorry it would be longer than that then so pre-pandemic yeah. so oh, no. at least three and a half years ago you guys are overdue then yeah, yeah. Well, I can only imagine if you spend yeah. so much time together creating things together that you're always going to have a spot for each other in your heart, you know? Yeah, of course. Yeah, of course. But there's a lot of guys from that time period I haven't seen. Yeah. yeah. Well, you went I, in a very I disappeared. Different <laughs> yeah. Yeah it's, yeah, it's actually, it's all me. I disappeared. I, I went off well, in a different direction. Well, that's a perfect direction. segue then. Yeah. Because so, yeah. this is what I'm very, very curious about. I mean, I, that's very interesting stuff about Buzz as well, but I'm very, very curious as to this shift in your life. And I read that in 2008, you had like a spiritual awakening. So I'm also yeah, very yeah, curious yeah. as to what was the catalyst for that. So if you can sort of <laughs> fill in the blanks here, how you go from doing a comedy show to all of a sudden getting into meditation in a big way and eventually developing your own practice my of own, meditation. Yeah, my own practice and everything. Uh, it was started back the last two seasons of Buzz. The last two seasons of Buzz. Um, I have an, uh, a friend and colleague of mine, Andrea Bain. Uh, she's in the industry right now. Um, if you if you look her up, Andrea Bain, she's done a million things. Got in Canadian, IMDb credits up the wall. Everything up okay. there. It's crazy the amount of credits this, this woman has. But... Uh, um, at the time, what year was this? At the time, I had this all in my head. Now I can't remember in the in, in, the, in the moment. Um, but we um, we were having a discussion about. Um, uh, she was telling me about that uh, she actually went to a hypnotherapist one time to help her with something. I can't remember what the situation was to help her with something, and she recommended it. And so I said, yeah, maybe I could use something like that to help me with um, uh, dealing with auditions. Because I always had an issue with auditions. I was never good at doing auditions. Like a lot of anxiety? Yeah, and anxiety would just come up. And it's not something I was ever used to. So it's in, in auditions, either that you already knew who I was from before and just gave me the part. Mm. But I'm not, I was not nailing it on the audition. It's because you already knew me and knew, knew my work or yeah. whatever. But it was, I always found that to be very difficult. So I said, maybe I should check out a hypnotherapist to see if I can deal with the anxiety. So um, I ended up going, and um, I went to this uh, hypnotherapist, um, this hypnotherapy place. It was called Positive Changes. Yeah, Positive Changes. So, um, but with their work, they used um, light and sound machines to help people to p- put people in, into meditative states uh, or hypnotic states, I, I should say, for this particular thing. So um, I found that very interesting that they had these light machines as this, this, this device, and it comes with goggles, and it comes with... Um, comes with goggles and it comes with a uh, headset with, with, sorry, did it come with headphones? How did it work again? No, because you had to get your own headphones. So it came with the device and the goggles. Okay. So you put that, so the goggles you put on, it flashes certain types of uh, frequencies of light in your eyes, with your eyes closed, of course, but it flashes a uh, frequency of light. And then um, through the device, it plays tones in your ear, um, which is called binaural beats. So I remember trying this machine, this device, and I found it really, really cool. Uh, it helped actually, I don't know if it helped me with the anxiety, but it helped me, it made me very creative. I was able to come up with a lot of ideas. So the last two seasons of Buzz, I owe that to using these light and sound machines. Oh, so, you credit it to that? Oh, interesting. Oh yeah, oh yeah. It just, just burst of ideas and, and all that stuff that happened after using them after a few weeks. So I found that very, very interesting. So I wanted to know, after a while, you know, your brain gets used to them. Yeah. So I wanted to know if there was anything else that was stronger that would um, help me further um, get into these states. So uh, at some point, um, so I found, at this point for you, it's not spiritual, really. It's no, no, just no. about trying to calm your just nerves. Just trying to, and, 
Well, that, even after, after that, it was like, how creative could I get? Oh, creativity, <laughs> yeah, as well. Okay. Yeah, like, can I tap into my creative potential by using these uh, machines? They're using these, uh, the, using this technology. So as time went on, shortly after, maybe like a few months in, um, uh, I found a program, uh, and they made these claims of what it can do in regards to meditation. And for some reason, that I was intrigued by that. Said, so "What meditation can do all that?" So they were just listing all the things that meditation can do that it can enhance your emotional growth and um, mental growth and spiritual growth, and it can do this and it can do that. And the claims that they were making was so too good to be true that I I was rejecting it. But at the same time, I was curious, and I said, "You know what? You know what? I got the money. Let me just order the program." So um, can't hurt to try. Can't hurt to try, right? Yeah. So I ordered the the sample that they were that they were giving out. So I, I ordered the sample. It took weeks. Back in those days, you had to place an actual order and wait for the package to come in. So I think it was about like three weeks later that um, the sample came in, and the sample had the technology in the background. But it's this guy named Bill Harris. Um, he passed away now. Um, uh, rest in peace. He passed away a few years ago. But um, uh, he's talking about this technology and what it could do for you. So I was like really stoked when I heard all the stuff that he claimed that it could do. So I said, you know, what? I'm going to order the actual program. So it's like a 13 level program. Uh, so I ordered the first level of the program and this is like the second last season of buzz. And I started using this thing every day and, um, I was blown away what this thing could do, at least in regards to, um, states of consciousness, like absolutely blown away what this, this, this thing could actually do. Hmm. So, um, I just kept doing it. I kept doing it every day. Uh, I'd, I'd wake up in the morning, I'd, do uh, an hour of this this meditation, and I'll go and shoot buzz, and go later later on go and I'll do my stand up and do all of that, and then all these strange things started happening. Um, so Which I don't has? know if I have well, well. The first thing that happened, well, the very first time that I used this technology, I remember sitting there, uh, sitting there, um, back straight, eyes closed, and something started. Um, uh, a pulsing sensation was happening on the top of my head. Um, now, were you it, someone that meditated a lot up to this point or no, no, no this was, was all I've brand never, new to you. never meditated in my life. Oh, okay. <laughs> Except for the light and sound machines and all that, but I've never really, I've done brand new. L okay. There was one time, there was one time when I was doing the light and sound machines where they had a, they had, um, one of the, one of the, the, the modules on the, the, the uh, on the device was a meditation, 20 minute meditation thing. I did try that. And I did that before going to a gig. I remember the gig too. I was doing a, I was doing a show at, um, University of Guelph. Oh, that's where my dad uh, yeah, is. Yeah, University of Guelph. Oh, yeah? <laughs> yeah. Okay, okay. Both my parents, actually. Both your parents, yeah. right? So I had a show there. And I, I remember going to the show and the calm that I felt uh, just going up to the stage. And I went, I've never felt this before. I, you usually feel the opposite, right? I usually feel yeah. the opposite. It, it made me so calm. And as I was doing the show, I just felt this level of calm throughout the whole thing. Shortly after that, uh, I tried that meditation again. So this is before doing this this program, program okay. right? Um, I was driving and um, it was a, some show out of town. But by the time I got, I was uh, somewhere out north. And by the time I got to a certain distance, it started snowing. And my, and my, co my vehicle slid off the road and they ended up hitting a, a snow bank. Um, yeah, that's what I remember. And I was calm throughout the whole thing. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is incredible. Yeah, I should be freaking out stressing. right now. <laughs> yeah, I'm not even stressing. And I'm like, oh, so that's what, when I heard about, when I heard about, uh, at least when I found this um, program online, I said I was intrigued by that just because of those two experiences. So that other than that, no, never. No, I've never meditated in my life other than prayer. <laughs> that doesn't even count. Well, it's, it's a whole different a thing. Form. Yeah. People say it's a form, but it's totally different. It yeah. has its own its own thing, right? Um, so I, I always, sometimes I even recommend the two, even in the, in the book uh, that I wrote, uh, Bodhi in the Brain, I recommend the two for people who want to incorporate meditation with prayer. Yeah. So yeah, so it's something that people can do as an integration thing. But um, other than that, no meditation whatsoever. So when I, felt, when I was doing it for the first time and I felt that sensation on the top of my head, at the time, uh, I didn't know anything about chakras. So for people who don't know, chakras are... Um, these energy centers that everyone has. Uh, so you have at least seven chakras within the body. Um, you have your uh, um, root chakra, your sacral chakra, uh, sorry, missing one, your root chakra, um, sacral chakra, no, I had that right, solar plex chakra, heart chakra, throat chakra, third eye chakra, and crown chakra. So I'm, I'm, this, I'm vaguely aware of this. I've looked vaguely, it up. Yeah. yeah. So it's these, these energy, energy centers, and on, your subtle, on the subtle level of who you are, these things keep you alive. So, but if they're out of whack, 
uh, it, it, it does, uh, it has, it has a, a positive or negative result depending on what's happening to these chakras within your body. So you have to, your job is to, is to fix these chakras, to have these chakras uh, spinning, uh, um, as opposed to it lacking in its, uh, in its, uh, um, operation. So your job is to, hmm. is to, is to activate these chakras and have them functional to the, to the best degree. So if any of your chakras are off, it affects your personality, it affects um, your your behavior, it affects the way how you deal with life and things of that sort. So each chakra has its own function type of thing. So if you're like less grounded, chances are your root chakra is, um, it could be in it, yeah, I've in, heard inactive. This. Yeah, so you have to get the root chakra active. I have ongoing throat issues for like a decade and oh, I've, yeah. I've had people say, well, it maybe be, it's your throat chakra. Could be the throat chakra. Yeah, yeah. my and mom's people, talked to me about stuff like that. Oh yeah, so that yeah. could be the throat. Uh, if you're dealing with uh, it challenges in regards to love or you know having uh, compassion, empathy, it could be the heart chakra and so on. The mm. crown chakra represents, at, at the level, if you get to the crown chakra, the crown, crown chakra represents uh, um, at least the road to enlightenment. Mm. So that, so that would be the goal is to get all the chakras going. So, um, I felt the sensation on the top of my head and I went, I have never felt that before in my entire life. What is that? Cause I didn't know, I didn't know anything about chakras at the time. And so that intrigued me. So I said, you know what, I'm going to keep doing this thing. So one of the strange sensations that happened, uh, short time later, um, I woke up, I woke up one day, I had a wet dream, just as out of the blue wet dream some girl Nocturnal i met eternal emission as they sometimes it was, it, call it, it what they can call it right <laughs> but i met this girl uh, through a friend of mine um no attraction to her whatsoever we just met i met her through my friend we had lunch next thing you know i'm having a dream about her and i had this wet dream <laughs> and I was like, yeah, what? Happens. Yeah. It's not supposed to, well, shit happened to someone that I actually. <laughs> well, it's true. And it yeah, usually but, happens more to like uh, kids hitting puberty and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah. Things of that sort, right? But I guess on a subconscious level, maybe there was something there. I don't know. But something hmm. happened and I had this wet dream. And it was like, not just a regular wet dream. It's like explosive. Like, <laughs> like what the? <laughs> right? So that. Clean up on <laughs> aisle three. <laughs> clean up on aisle three. So that, that, that intrigued me. Uh, and then later on, as time went on, then like negative things started happening. So like I ended up having like, um, uh, well, sorry, what I always screw this part up. Um, fear of the outdoors is called, uh, like agoraphobia. Ag say it again. Agoraphobia. agoraphobia. Or is, I thought that was uh, a fear of crowds, but it's just a fear of going outside. It's going okay. outside. It's like the opposite, opposite of claustrophobia essentially, right? Is that what? Yeah. Claustrophobia yeah. Claustrophobia is yeah. like when you're afraid of when being, you're afraid in, small of being in small spaces. And in this case it's about being in the outdoors, right? Yeah. Like if a claustrophobic person and an agoraphobic person just switched locales, they'd both be happier, you know, <laughs> claustrophobic guy needs to go outside and the other guy needs to come in. Exactly. Yeah. 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 The things would be better for the both of them. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but if for like a week straight, I went through that and so but i wasn't i wasn't frightened because they tell you about all these things they tell you about all the things that could go wrong and all the things that can go right but they're all temporary right okay so i wasn't i wasn't scared to the point where i was like oh my gosh i, just, I should stop doing this thing it made me want to do more so um, explore that why is this exploring. happening so why is this happening because yeah. i was i was always into um psychology and things of that sort so when all these things started happening i was like this is really really cool i want to explore it more so i went through a week of that and i got over that piece because it was um i was i Literally, if I looked outside, I'd be afraid. I'd be frightened. It's like I'm looking at a monster or something. Sounds like a bad trip on acid or something. Not even. <laughs> <laughs> worse than that. Not even. Not e yeah. I wouldn't say worse than that, but um, but it was enough for me to yeah. Uh, where I, I knew that I couldn't. Uh, yeah, and I had to cancel a couple of my gigs, mm. uh, so I couldn't go to my uh, to certain gigs because of that until it cleared up. Were you just like ordering food to the the house? I stayed. I stayed. The, the, the experience only lasted for about a week, but I probably stayed in, indoors for about a good three weeks because at this point <sighs> we finished shooting all our episodes, and I canceled all my my whatever stand up gigs that I had, so I stayed in the house. For about three weeks, I remember having a full head of hair because I didn't even cut my hair uh, for those three weeks. So I was just meditating uh, and all that. Uh, and then as time went on, uh, another strange thing that happened is, um, and this is like I think this was this was this was our last season. It may have been the second last, could have been the last. I can't remember, but um, I remember it was Carabana Weekend. That I remember. It was Carabana Weekend. We were shooting what stuff for Buzz. Carabana is a festival, is uh, is our like our West Indian festival that we do every year. Okay. So at the time it was called Carabana. Now it's called um, um, uh, Carnival. I think they just call it Carnival now. The Carnival Carabana Festival. I can't remember. But it's originally for, for, for many, many years it was called Carabana. Okay. We recently changed the name. Um, so um, uh, I, I, was at, I was at the festival on the Friday because we were shooting stuff for Buzz at the festival. That I remember. And then I remember going home that night falling asleep and and then I woke up in the middle of the night and I was drunk. 
I don't drink. <laughs> I'm not a drinker. feeling of wildly intoxicated. Yeah, being intoxicated Weird. all the way through. I woke up and I was drunk. And I went, what the hell is going on? I am drunk out of my mind right now. And I, I'm not a drinker. Right. That's so insane. It was insane. So what I did was uh, I was so curious that I wanted to try experiments. So what I did was as time went on, this is probably like the la this is still the last second. Yeah, it was the second last season of the show because I just remember another incident. So, yeah, so it was the second last season. So what, what happened was after that, I wanted to see what would happen if I did drink. So um, I drank. I remember I, I picked up drinking again. I, I, I started drinking and I couldn't get drunk. So Weird. it got to the point where it's like, okay, let me try mixing drinks. So I would mix my drinks and everything. Couldn't get drunk. And I say, like, okay, there's something going on with so this. You're getting thing. drunk when you're not. Yeah, drinking. when I'm not drinking, and when you're trying and I, to drink, I can't get drunk. Pop kiss. Yeah, I can still do this till this day. Where if I drink, I won't get drunk. That's, right. Yeah. So it, it was it, that was just how is that physically possible? That's crazy. I would drive and everything. Well, not from drinking, but the times when I would wake up uh, drunk, I'd go driving and everything, see if I could drive, and I could drive perfectly well. <laughs> But you still but felt weird. Just felt intoxicated the whole time. Wow. Yeah. So that's what that's what got me. So you know what? I I need to see this through. So yeah. So I um and now at this point we're in this, the last season of Buzz. So we're we're shooting our episodes. I'm meditating every day. Even when we went on the road, I took my at the time we were using CDs and uh, uh, Walkmans and CD and all that man, stuff. Yeah, right? yeah. So I would I would uh, take all my stuff on the road, no matter where where we went. I always did my hour every time. And I remember just talking about it with, um, I, don't, I didn't talk about it much with Darren because Darren wasn't into those things, but I'd have those conversations with other, some of the other uh, crew members about this thing because how I was just so excited about this, this technology. So um, I'm doing my meditation every day and then that, you know, uh, I'm doing all that. And then um, the show comes to an end and uh, the show comes to an end and I tried, we were trying to come up with another project not not with darren but i was trying to come up with a project with another comedian um with gavin stevens oh yeah with yeah, gavin yeah, stevens that show was supposed to be called engine number nine yeah so engine number nine was supposed to be that it was supposed to be a sketch comedy show and we started going around we started to pitch it there was another idea that i was pitching too at the time it was called philosophy and we did a segment on the comedy network for that uh, but it never got we, it, we, i didn't push it uh, far enough for it to get picked up. So we jumped on to this other project, which is engine number nine with Gavin Stevens. So rem I remember doing that. And then after that, I just lost all uh, motivation to do anything. There was just a moment I woke up and it's like, I don't want to do this anymore. Yeah. So it's kind of a blessing though, really. You don't waste any more time. Well, well at that time it was a curse because <laughs> I need, I needed another gig, well, but, fair, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I lost all motivation. Later on, I found out that this happens to people on that path. Uh, oh, really? They may leave their careers or they lose the motivation. Some quit their jobs. Some people leave their wives and all these crazy things that would happen. But for me, I just lost the zeal of entertaining people, period. Hmm. So I just you dropped to look out. Inward now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just, I dropped out. I was out of work for two years. I was just taking care of my two boys. My, I have three kids, so my daughter wasn't born yet. So I had my two, my, my two boys. I was taking care of them for the, for the, uh, for the, for about two years and, uh, no job, no nothing, whatever. And, uh, I was doing stand up here and there. Um, still meditating other, other gigs, daily. Yeah, still med meditating. I've never missed a day in 20 years. Wow. So even up to this day, I've always never an missed, hour too. I've always done at least an hour. Sometimes I meditate up to four hours. Because that's impressive. Like finding the time to meditate at all is impressive, in my opinion. Yeah. It's something I always say I want to do, and there's always something else taking me away from, you know, some sort yeah. of excuse. But Which I hear hour. a lot. Well, and, yeah, yeah, I can imagine. I and hear then, this a lot. An hour is substantial in a 24 hour day where yeah. you're sleeping eight of those, you know, that's yeah. hard to put aside. I always did my hour. Always did my hour. And then the odd time I do, you know, two hours. Actually, often I do, I do two hours often. Um, but once in a while, I do three hours, four hours. And, Crazy. Yeah. But I always put in my hour. So for the last 20 years, uh, that's what I've been doing. Yeah. So um, uh, I would do the odd gig here and there. And around 2006, that's when I did my last gig, which was, it was with Gavin Stevens. The last gig that I did was with Gavin. I did other, I did other like MC spots here and there. Other than that, which probably, probably even went into, gosh, 2008, 2009, maybe. Um, but for actual like hardcore stand up, up to 2006, I stopped. Okay. Uh, and then um, I just had this, uh, this um, motivation to go into community work. So I, that's what I, I ended up in that field and that's I'm still in that field to this day. Yeah. 
So I'm in, I'm in, I'm in the, the nonprofit field. So I went and I became a youth worker. And um, yeah, I became a youth worker and I started running programs for youth in the community. And I started teaching some of the stuff that I knew through Eastern philosophy and all that. And so I started creating um, personal development programs for, for youth for years. I did this for years and, and all that. So that's, mm. what, that's what came out of that. So I was employed. So I was employed again. So that's what I did. Uh, so this very day is what I do. Um, so at this point, this is 2006. Um, 2006, maybe your audience would love this because um, I get, I, uh, sometimes I get in trouble for this, but I don't really care. It's, just, it's who I am. <laughs> I like <right>? it already. <laughs> <laughs> like you mentioned the whole LSD thing, right? So yeah, yeah. Um, in 2000 and gosh, was it, I think it was still 2006. Well, before trying um, brainwave entrainment, I'm going to go back a little bit. I'm going to rewind a little bit. Before going to brainwave entrainment, I had a friend of mine. Um, we're still good friends to this day. Uh, she always tried to get me to do psychedelics. You could never, if you knew me back in the buzz days, you could never get, you could never get me to do a psychedelic. Pops ever. Mushrooms, <laughs> right. She recommended mushrooms. I had another friend who recommended, um, uh, recommended, um, uh, uh, MDA. MDMA. Yeah. MDMA. There's MDA and MDMA. She offered one of them. Okay. I think it was MDMA she offered. That's like ecstasy, right? Yeah. Basically. I turned it down. Yeah. Like, There's no way I'm doing this. I didn't whatever. know that was a psychedelic. I guess that makes sense. Though. Well, it's not a pure psychedelic. It's man-made, isn't it? It's a compound well, or something? Well, or? psychedelics could be man-made too. Oh, but, true. But, but yeah, MDMA, acid, yeah. Yeah, MDMA is not a, it's not a trip to me. And it's, uh, gosh, it's um, what family group does that fall into again? It will come to me in a second. Sure. But it's not yeah. a trip to me. It's not a trip to me. So, but it's not a, it's not a pure psychedelic. Uh, as, as opposed to LSD and, or ayahuasca and, or, or ayahuasca yeah. or well, ayahuasca uh, contains uh, DMT yes, and there's yes. five meal DMT and all that type of stuff. Right. So, um, my fr a friend of mine, she offered shrooms, um, uh, psilocybin, which you can now uh, buy on banks, you can, you, which you can get anywhere. Right. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, I, I shut it down for the pat for how many times prior to that. And then one day before we went to England, uh, for buzz, I said, let me try it. <laughs> all right. So I tried, I tried shrooms. And that, that could have been the gateway. So before I did uh, uh, any of the brainwave entrainment, I had this beautiful experience with shrooms. And I, I think that's what set me on the path. Do you remember how much you ate? I didn't know anything about grams or anything like uh, that. Okay. Yeah, but I probably had about, it could have been about three grams. Yeah, I was going to say, it must have been a decent amount if you're having yeah, like a it could spiritual have been about, Yeah, it could kind have been of, about three grams. Yeah, that's yeah. a lot. <laughs> which, is a lot which, which I found out later that it's a lot. Like yeah, if, three if to I was going to do it, I'd lot. probably take like, a gram and a half if I wanted yeah. to have a fun kind of experience. Yeah. Three or four, you're having like... Yeah, she gave me enough. Seeing God. <laughs> yeah. she, may, she she could have given me less. I just don't I don't remember. But it, based on my experience with it, it felt like it could have been about three. Okay. Yeah. So I had this... I uh, ended up having this beautiful spiritual experience. Don't even ask me what it was because I don't remember it. Um, but I, it, it affected me. So that I remembered. So maybe that I carried that into... Um, once the whole brainwave entrainment thing came in. So I already had this like, spiritual experience, um, nothing like awakening or anything like that, but something that touched me really deeply. Uh, and I spoke about it many times to other people about this thing. And people was like, what are you doing shrooms for? You know, you're not supposed to be doing that stuff. And there's other people like, yeah, I've tried that before. And all that it was viewed stuff, very yeah. differently back then back by then. the public for yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah. It was like a, you know, hardcore narcotic people would think of like, you get, <laughs> well, you could get thrown in jail, I think for having shrooms back around then it was a really big deal. And depending where you are, especially here, you still can. Yeah. Uh, yeah it, well, can. I went to a shroom store with my friend. He wanted to buy some a couple of weeks ago and there, it's in the weird gray zone right now that uh, weed stores were in pre-legalization where yeah. the cops are like, yeah, we're not going to shut it down, but it's <laughs> still it technically too. not legal. <laughs> yeah, probably. Yeah. They done it themselves. <laughs> but yeah, they're not being uh, inconspicuous. You go on Bank Street, there's a huge store with like a neon mushroom on the front. Oh, like, it's okay. very open. And oh, yeah? I, I talked to the guy and he said, yeah, they just they, they don't see the point because it's on its way to legalization. Yeah, it's on its way. Yeah. So, and as far as cool I know, it's legal in Jamaica now too. So, oh, is it? Yeah, because yeah. they they realize that they have a whole industry uh, for um, they have a whole industry for psilocybin in Jamaica. Because so. when I went there in 2016, as far as I understood it, even weed wasn't technically legal in Jamaica. And yet, as soon as I got in the cab at the airport, the guy was trying to sell me a, <laughs> a nice bag of weed. So, yeah. you know. Anyways, that's very interesting though. Yeah, because there are places like California, I think Colorado, a couple oh, yeah. states that are doing it as well. They were doing it as well, right? Hmm. Yeah. Okay, so you had this amazing experience. Yeah, I had that. I had that amazing experience. And if you and can I actually explain to my audience, because I have read this part of the book, but uh, brainwave entrainment. 
uh, just sort of what that is. Basically. Oh, yes. Yeah, it's, yeah. What is brainwave entrainment? Um, what are there's different forms of brainwave entrainment. The one that I'm referring, the ones that I'm referring to are uh, binaural beats. So there's binaural beats, monaural beats, isochronic tones, and there's many others. Uh, I shouldn't say many, but there's several others. Uh, so I specialize with binaural beats. So binaural beats is basically on the basic level. If you take two tones, so if you have a tone, just say, for example, a tone of, um, I don't know, 100 hertz. Okay. And you have another tone. So you play 100 hertz in one ear and you have another tone of 110. You play it in the other ear. The center of your brain will produce a frequency of 10 hertz. So it'll, it'll, it'll play a differential, essentially. Yeah. Of, okay. the two, of the two tones. It'll pay the difference of the two tones and your brain will entrain to 10 hertz. So years ago, like um, back in the, I think it was in the seventies, they realized that when they did studies on these things, that it produced the same type of states that people were in when they were meditating, mm. right? Type of thing. So the same kinds of brain waves were generated. Were being generated okay. by by using these tones. So a whole thing sprung up back in those days, and then it died off, and then it became a big thing again. Um, it became a big thing again once um, the internet became a thing. When the internet became a thing, and people could put things on digitally. Um, it became a thing again. So that's probably how I ended up hearing about it because well, the uh, internet was great for that. A lot of things yeah. that were considered fringe, all of a sudden you could find other you people, like minded people. individuals, yeah. you know, and you can actually experiment with them, see if they actually work. Cause a yeah. lot of things that don't work. All right. But there's things that are, they were like, they're really legit. It's just science haven't really made a focus on certain things. Yeah. But I tried these things for myself and I was blown away. Yeah. Um, well, and that's the, the things I evidence. tried and nothing ever happened. Right. So, but binaural beats is one of the things where I said, Hmm, I'm really, really intrigued by this. So, mm -hmm. uh, and now a lot of people have heard of binaural beats, but there's a lot of information they haven't heard about. Hence why I, I wanted to put a book, uh, put a book together about it. So, um, when can people get this book, by the way, it's not released yet or, uh, it is released. Um, right now I just got approval for, for, um, for, uh, global distribution. So people can get it on Lulu books. Okay. So it is available there right now. And in, uh, in, in about two months or so in about eight weeks or less than eight weeks now, it'll be available on Amazon and, and okay, everything. Good but to people can pick it up right now on, on Lulu. Yeah. I just wanted to make sure we mentioned that for anyone who's finding this really interesting, you oh, yeah. can delve yeah. into this book. It's yeah. very, very cool stuff. What makes, what makes our stuff different though, is, um, we do low carrier frequency binaural beats. So, um, this is what Bill Harris was doing with his, with his company. So um, by low carrier uh, frequencies, we can tap into advanced meditative states uh, and all that. So uh, this is why there's so many levels. So like with his program, there are levels with mine. There's also different levels because you have to, it gets stronger um, with each level. So the, the carrier frequencies get lower. That when The lower the carrier frequency, the higher the amplitude. Hmm. So and that's why we have so many levels you in have our to progress. progress. So you have to progress to okay. going down the different levels, which take you will take you about 15, 16, 17 years to get through the whole thing, um, right? So this is not no, this is not in some some easy. It's not a flash offense. in the pan. Yeah, you got to um, be committed. Yeah, it's not a magic bullet. You got to really be committed, and you have to put the work into it, just like with traditional meditation. But it sounds like if people experience the effects that you had, that you're going to want to put that work in because it sounds like you're or really... or it scares people. Oh yeah, yeah. I meet. I I, I get the two sides. So, so, and I'll get into that in a, in a second, sure, if, yeah. if I can, because it's, it's the thing I'm about to get into is going to be very, very difficult to explain, but, um, where did I leave off? That's the part I don't uh, remember. Just, <laughs> I was asking you about brainwave entrainment in Before general. that, before uh, that, about brainwave entrainment, uh, the, the, the shrooms experience. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So, yeah. So after having that experience, um, I was intrigued that, which got me to brainwave entrainment. But later on, as I was doing brainwave entrainment, I, um, I, because I'm, you know, creative guy, you know, I've been always been coming up with creative ideas all my life. Uh, I wanted to see what would happen if, if someone started to, um, mesh the two, if someone, uh, took, uh, meditation and combined it with taking entheogens. Well, that's another name. Entheogens means to awaken the God within. So oh, cool. that's the actual name for what we call psychedelics. So entheogens, huh. right? So, um, I came up with this idea. So what if I combine the two? Uh, so I did some research to see if, uh, if anyone's ever done that. And I'm not necessarily talking about brainwave entrainment, but just meditation. So I said, has anyone like meditated and did this with a psychedelic? So I did my research and, you know, found out that people have been doing this for centuries. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing new. Millennia, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I said, okay, what would happen if I did, uh, entheogens with brainwave entrainment? So, right. So I started doing the first experiments by doing brainwave entrainment with, with shrooms, with psilocybin. Uh, well, at first I did it with weed and that blew me away, which is a low level psychedelic, low, low level type of type of, I would even call it a psychedelic, but, yeah. <laughs> right. But, um, low level, but, um, I had a psychedelic experience by doing the two together. 
Okay. And so, so I said, what would happen if I did it with psilocybin? Did that. Mind blown. Even more. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Even more, right? Um, from three grams, five grams, whatever. Mind blown. Just totally mind blown of what took place. And I started doing this on a regular basis. Uh, and it was only with psilocybin at that time. Um, so I'm doing my meditation. My, my uh, energy wasn't created yet. So... Um, at this point I'm experimenting, I'm, I'm making my own type of sounds, but I'm listening to the Bill Harris's program the whole time. Well, we should mention that you studied sound engineering, so you're not just like, some yeah, I study guy fiddling around. You, you yeah, know, this I, stuff. yeah, I had, I had, uh, uh, experience in sound engineering. Yeah. I studied uh, sound engineering in regards to music production and things of that sort. Later on, I had to go back and learn more stuff about sound physics and what actually happens um, with sound physics in general, but I already had a background in, in uh, musical, musical engineering. At least a basic comprehension yeah, of, you, of what of, you're dealing with. Okay. What I'm dealing with. At least I knew how to put the stuff together Yeah, um, because of learning that in college. So, um, uh, so I started doing that, doing my meditation every day. And then and once in a while experimenting with, with the psilocybin. And I was just totally blown away of all the things that took place there. Uh, by, the, by 2008 is when I had what people will call stream entry. Uh, so um, in 2008, I had a full like blown spiritual uh, awakening, which kind of like changed the, the perspective of how I view the reality. So that's what, that's what happened in 2008. This is how you got into... Um it, I think it's called non dual non duality. It was well that experience itself was a non dual. Okay, but it was enough for me to go deeper to see if I can experience non duality. Because I was not aware of what this is. I looked it up, yeah. and it, this is what I wrote: non duality <laughs> equals the force. <laughs> kind equals of? the force. <laughs> like, well, that we everything is one energy, kind of right. <laughs> oh, I see. I see. I see. Well, that's funny because you connected it back to Star Wars. Yeah, right? I got a yeah. Star Wars shirt. Yeah. It crossed my mind, but yeah. <laughs> and, and also one thing because I, I've thought about that concept previous to to researching this episode. I've thought about that idea of uh, interconnectivity between all things. Mm -hmm. uh, and one thing that I think scares me about that is that if if I get into some meditative state and I'm trying to become one with that energy. <laughs> Does that mean I like that Hitler is a part of me now? Jeffrey Dahmer is a part of me? Like if everything's create, uh, created and connected, then are you connected to those evil, you know, all horrible of, things? All those things are, uh, they're, they're you. But I don't want to be connected to that. <laughs> you know, that would, that's the part that freaks yeah. me out about yeah. that. Yeah. And, and I agree with that. I totally agree with that. Um, but at the higher level of, uh, of this level of consciousness, you realize that everything really is just... I don't want to say a game because when people hear that say, how dare you? No, but I've heard this, a dance that it's yeah, all, you can uh, say game, yeah. you can say a dance, you can say a dream, you can say, and this is something that, um, this, this, this one, uh, so consciousness is making up. So hmm. it's making it all up. So in this case, um, you're going to have, po you're going to have positive and negative. And the reason why you have positive and negative, because it, the source itself can't die. So, it, and it's, it's highly imaginative. It's creative. It's, it's, whatever it is. So it, 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 and because it's the only thing that exists, it decides to create everything into existence. Anything that it can possibly do, it tries to see if it can create that in what we call reality. Whether good or bad. Rather good or bad. Okay. Because at the end of the day, it's playing all the characters. So no does matter what it does. we don't have free will then? It, like uh, sort of like fate or, or destiny or is it? It's a tricky one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, this is very interesting stuff. Yeah, it's, a, it's a tricky one. Um, you do have free will, but I would say it's not Oliver that has free will. It, it is that collective consciousness collective. because I'm a part of that. Okay. Yeah. It's hard that, to wrap your head around yeah, it a little bit. That thing has free will. Yeah. Okay. All right. So it does whatever it chooses to do. And you're just along for the ride. I'm you're, like an you're avatar. <laughs> you're like an avatar. <laughs> okay. Because well, avatar means God walking in human form. Oh, wow. Yeah. So that's what I that means. Know. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. So you are right now God walking in human form. Uh, a lot of people don't like the word God. So you can still say consciousness walking in human form or source walking in human form or universe walking in individual human form. Um, my, my biggest exposure to this kind of line of thinking is actually uh, comedian Pete Holmes. I don't know if you ever listen. Pete, Pete Holmes. Pete Holmes. Yeah. He's pretty big. He has a podcast oh. called You Made It Weird. And he talks about this kind of stuff often that um, we are awareness like we're i am awareness. not oliver i am what's seeing through oliver's eyes and and yeah so I, I, that would be like the empty witness okay yeah so the same thing with what you just said um they have many terms for that so one of the term is empty witness mm. so behind oliver behind morgan uh there is an empty witness that's watching everything coming into being but the empty witness that's watching everything is the manifest is the manifester of everything coming into being oh wow right but that's not non-duality yet 
<laughs> oh man, we're going down yeah, the rabbit hole. Yeah, that that step is called um, Turiya. Okay. Right. So at the Turiya level, that's what this empty witness is doing. Now, when you get to non-duality, non-duality, now now there's no distinction between two things. So as the empty witness is watching its own manifestation, there is no distinction between the empty self and its manifestation, which is the universe itself. Right. Wow. They they now become one. That's heavy. Yeah, because from the empty witness standpoint. Time is not the same as how we see time as the avatars. Time is just part of the story that it's making up so that we can have this experience because it's the only thing that exists. And because it's the only thing that exists, it has nothing else to do except for make things up. This almost sounds like simulation theory. Yeah. To, to some extent. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that's and it is. You I, can take it, you can you take it and you can associate it to that because it's just kind of what it's doing. So yeah. it just makes these simulations, right? So it, it does that because it's beyond space, it's beyond time, it's beyond, um, it's beyond location, all that stuff. So what it's doing is being, it's doing, it's playing the opposite of itself. So everything that it can do that is the opposite of itself, this is what we're experiencing as human beings, as animals, as uh, reptiles, as uh, microscopic creatures, as everything that, that carries what you call consciousness into being. Hmm. So all of that, uh, this empty witness is, is making up as a as a dream the thing about the empty witness is as it's playing oliver as it's playing morgan it forgets that it's the empty witness it actually thinks it's that's oliver the ego i guess that's the ego okay thinking that it's morgan thinking that it's oliver living this terrible or beautiful or neutral experience yeah and, and so, that can be very consuming and that, that can yeah that it can be voice in your head over this and over and over again, said, this yeah. is who I am. I am yeah. this, I am that, I am great, I am not great. How comes this person is better than me? How come, you know, what, what all that stuff, that's the ego doing its thing. So it's playing a trick on itself just because it has nothing else to do because it's the only thing that exists in existence itself. So it creates all these characters for eternity, for eternity because okay. it has the power to do so. So in so, this line of thinking, when our, our human vessel expires, is there a, a higher echelon you can move to or is it immediately just your because I've heard this comparison, which I found kind of comforting that our our body is like a glass of water. And when we die, it just gets poured back into the ocean kind of. And then that's a good way of looking. Yeah, at it. I, yeah, I found that very easy to wrap my head around and kind of yeah. like conceive. OK, yeah, the, that makes the, only, sense. the only thing I would change about that is um, when you die, what we consider death is not death yet. Right. That's okay. that's how we perceive death. So if, if you're in, in this simulation and you, and your body comes to an end and it's within the simulation, we call that death. But going back to what you were saying just earlier, just now, um, there were other cycles that happens before going back to the oneness that oh, could happen, right? So post physical death, there's still more, there's still stuff that, more stuff. So okay. there's other cycles that a person may go through, um, whether from alternate reality positions or from subtle uh, states of reality, all these things could happen. The reason why, a person within this reality may choose to meditate and follow the path is because they want to bypass all that, mm. right? They want to bypass all that so that, because all this stuff, all the, all the different realities that we can live in, um, causes suffering. So that's why the Buddha said all life is suffering. But when he says suffering, it doesn't mean like extreme suffering. It's not just extreme suffering. It's also just discomfort. Yeah. Um, disease, uh, dissatisfaction, um, all that type heartbreak, of stuff is included. Yeah. Heartbreak, all that stuff is included with all the things that can happen throughout your lifetime. But these happen in the subtle states too. So even when you die, if you end up playing another role uh, within the, the death realm, if you want to call it the death realm, but from your standpoint, you're just living out another type of reality. It's like a limbo kind of almost or? Yeah, so, something like that. Some, okay. um, But there's still suffering that's happening. So the reason why you want to bypass all that, because if you can bypass all that and you can go to absolute oneness, you realize that you're the one that created everything into being. Wow. Yeah. So at that, the, this is like Nirvana or Bodhi, right? It gets, it gets to, well, Bodhi, Bodhi, uh, I, I realize this is not easy stuff. To it's explain. not easy. Yeah. It's not easy. Right. So yes. Right. Uh, it's hard to say that when, when, uh, Buddha became enlightened, was he at that stage yet? Or did he end up at that stage as time went on? I believe that he, um, as time went on, he eventually ended up to the stage of what you call, um, because in Buddhism, they call that Nirvana and, uh, in, uh, Hinduism, they call that Muksha. Hmm. Right. So they're kind of the same thing in the sense. It's just in Nirvana, um, you're witnessing the no self in, in Muksha, you're witnessing the self, but what I'm trying to, what I'm proposing is you're supposed to experience the two together. You're supposed to experience the no self and the, and the self as one thing. And when you reach that, I would call that 
true, I would call that muksha. I would call that nirvana. Because uh, when you is realize this the place you've reached, I've done all that. Yeah, wow. but that didn't happen until 2019. So you had to put in some serious work. I put in say, as as I said earlier, that meditation practice went in every single day. For at that point, it was t- uh, 16 and a half years. Every single day up to that point. Yeah, that's a severe yeah. devotion. That's yeah, with, really with including including um, other practices too. So I'm doing at this point because I, I, I created Unergy in in, in uh, 2010. I created Unergy. So at that point, I started doing Unergy on on a on a daily basis. Where does the name come from for that? I, I was also curious about. Oh, Energy. how did I? Well, I was th- I was gonna call it Energy, like meaning inner God, oh, God okay. within. I was gonna call it that, and somewhere down the line, it ended in I I added in the Y. And just called it energy, but first it was going to be called energy. Okay, <laughs> so that's where that came from. I just didn't like the way how it looked on paper. Okay, so after a while, I added the. So I said, oh, okay, that could probably mean like yin and yang. So it's like the yin. That's sort of what I was of, thinking. Yeah. yeah, and then it just became energy, and it just stuck for me. Okay, yeah, so that's where that came from. Yeah. Well, and in the end, the title is not that important. It's the practice. It's the, really... it's the actual practice yeah. itself, right? So uh, uh, putting in the years of of that practice. Um, but I also did neurofeedback training. I've also did traditional meditation, which I still do to this day, but I did neurofeedback training. I did electrical stimulation. I did, um, I did, um, gosh, how many different types of trainings I did, uh, Kundalini yoga training. Okay. I've heard so I did that. Some, yeah. I did some training with the yogi. Her name is, uh, her, uh, Krishna Kerr. Uh, I did, so I did training in that area. Um, I did, um, and I did other types of yoga training too, but I also did, uh, some Qigong training. Oh gosh, I did some other stuff. Um, the list goes on of all the different things I did. Um, I like though that you diversified. Yeah, because I'm, I'm trying to find what because everyone ha- everyone has this thing. This is the thing to do. That's the thing. This is the thing to do. It says, well, let me try them all. Well, that's like religion. Right? <laughs> Everyone's trying to tell you that their religion that is the right religion. The, yeah, the other the ones best. are terrible, and you should yeah. not follow them. And because there's people who try to convince me that yoga is the way to go, and there's other people who try to convince me that meditation is the go. So you know, I'll just do them both. Other mm-hmm. people say. Uh, psychedelics is the way to go. Don't do meditation, do psychedelics. And so, you know what guys, I'm going to do the meditation. Do <laughs> I'm going to do the brainwave entrainment. I'm going to do the yoga. I'm going to do the, um, I'm going to do the entheogens and see what happens. Right. So at now at this point, I've already had the spiritual awakening in 2008, which was mind blowing. It was so profound that, uh, yeah, like what did that experience consist of? If you can, if I can, if I can describe it, yeah, it's not an easy thing. To, <laughs> yeah, if I could describe it, um, it was like the empty self that I was talking about earlier. So it was the empty, it's like the empty self realizing that, um, everything that's in the reality was a manifestation of myself, but not myself as Morgan, myself yeah, as yeah. the empty self. Um, so it was like the Godhead. So in that moment, I, I realized for the first time what I was. So all the other entheogen experiences that I had prior to that, none of that stuff ever even came, uh, come close to what happened on that day. So that was the moment where um, I was meditating. So what happened was I took I took the psilocybin and I, because uh, remember, I'm doing the experiment, right? Which I've done how many times at this point? And, you know, they worked up to this point. So I was doing, so again, I was doing um, psilocybin along with the, with the brainwave entrainment program. Nothing happened. It didn't, it, nothing happened. I thought it didn't work. I got frustrated. I remember f- throwing off the headphones and I was just sitting there on my bed on a Saturday afternoon saying, oh, that was a waste of my time. And as I said that, boom, I realized sure I was kinda... the empty self. Oh, wow. Yeah. So even after you don't even have the headphones on anymore. I don't have the headphones on. I'm sitting there and my head goes up and I realized I was the entire universe. Oh, weird. I thought that when you had that moment, you would be having like an out of body experience. Not- I, I've never had an out of body experience. That's okay. the thing. I've gone through most experiences that people talk about. I've never had an, uh, an out of body one. Yeah. Okay. So that didn't, that didn't happen at all. I just remember throwing out the headphones, being frustrated and sitting there saying that failed. What a waste of my time. And as I did that, Someone I broke. Just washed over you. Yeah, I broke and I was no longer Morgan. Wow. I was aware of Morgan. But I was now the empty self You're not experiencing. identifying with that. I'm not anymore. identifying with that. I'm, I'm no longer attached to it. I just realized I was this essence. I was just pure essence. So how does that... Within the body of Morgan. I still knew I was Morgan, but I wasn't attached to... Yeah, you're not yeah. like completely disassociated yeah. from your human yeah. form. Because I was still able to get up, move around, and everything I looked at, I was, it's like I was looking at myself as the empty witness. So if I was looking at any of this stuff that's on your desk now, I saw the empty witness. I looked at the table, I saw the empty witness. I look at you, I see, I see the empty witness. I see, even in, the, in the, the space in between myself and yourself, I saw the empty witness even up to the point. It was up to the point where there was no, um, there was no, um, there was no um, distinction between the space in between us 
and you being attached to the space in between us and, and myself being attached to the space that's in between us. All that stuff, I saw that as the empty self. Wow. It was absolutely extraordinary. It's complete one. Yeah. I walked, out of, I walked out of my room, walked into my, my kid's room, because my daughter was really, really small at the time. She was just a baby at the time. Um, but I, I walked into my, my boy's room, and all I saw was the empty witness looking at my sons. I knew who they were. I knew they were Tavon and Darnell. But I, all I saw was the empty witness. I went to the bathroom. I looked into the toilet. I looked at the, the water in the toilet, and all I saw was the empty witness. The toilet itself, all I saw was the I empty witness. I thought you were going to say a turd, so. No, because <laughs> I didn't take one at the time. Yeah. <laughs> but, but you right, But I just looked. Like, yeah. yeah, I just looked at everything, and I just saw pure empty, the pure emptiness of, of all being. And at that moment, I knew. People say, well, Morgan, that was just a belief. But in that moment, I knew that everything was of the same source. And so it's never changed from that day. I was going to say, how do you go on? How much does that drastically change the way you live your life moving forward? Because I feel like after something <laughs> like that, you must see someone frustrated by something trivial and you just want to probably shake him and go like, this is yeah, not like, the come way. Come on, buddy. Yeah, this is <laughs> You're not gone. Come on. Yeah. Come on. Shake. Get out of it. Come on. Yeah, it was like that, really. It's still like that till now. Um, well, I, actually I, had wanted to... I had a conversation with someone who's going through a, a terrible situation right now. And being human... I have to do the right thing and try to help her through it. But in my mind, I'm just like, you're God, <laughs> but puts things in I can't do that. I realized through time, as time went on, I can't just be, I can't just tell anyone that, especially <laughs> when they're going through moments like it's just not cool. It's insensitive. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. not the right thing to do. It seems callous. Yeah. yeah. So I'm just like, Oh my gosh, how am I going to get around this. Right. But I had to do the human thing and try to help her through it. But in the whole time in my mind, I'm like, Oh my gosh, if you only knew what you're actually There's were another way, yeah. um, she would still suffer but you would do it from an enlightened standpoint hmm. because suffering doesn't go away. It's still, it stays um, because that's the human condition, but you but start to see it from agonize a different, you in the same it doesn't way. agonize you in the same way. You start to see it from a different perspective. And that perspective is what's, um, is the, is the liberation, the free, the freedom and that calmness, um, of, of the calmness, the, the liberation of, of all the things that you're attached to. Right. So after that experience in 20, in 2008 for two weeks, I was stunned. Stunned out of my mind. I, mean, I couldn't believe what happened. I was like, did I go, am I insane? What the hell just took place? Uh, it stayed like that for two weeks. I didn't say anything to anyone for two weeks. Because you were worried, like, maybe. And it's I'm not that I was worried, but it was just, I was, I was cautious. I was cautious. So I was just like, what would happen if I told someone this? Right? So two weeks later, I'm at work as a youth worker. And I, I decide to uh, uh, bring it up with uh, one of my good friends, one of my coworkers, which is one of my good friends, uh, Michael Israel is his name. He was the first person I ever told. And when I told him, he went, wow. <laughs> that was my reaction. So I, yeah. So I was like, oh, okay, maybe I can tell other people. Uh, I ended up telling another person. Yeah, he didn't laugh you out of the room or no, anything. No, he didn't do any of that. He was just like, wow. He looked like he was intrigued by the whole thing, right? And so I, the second person I ever told um, was, uh, he was uh, he's not my, one of my best friends, but at the time was one of my participants. His name is Chris Steff. Uh, he was the second guy I told and he's like, yo, whatever, whatever you did, I want that too. <laughs> right? So that was our reaction. But I turned, I told a third guy, it was a guy that I went to high school with and we haven't spoken to this very day. He was so offended by what I told him. Oh yeah. He really? was, yeah, it bothered, it really bothered him. Um, so, um, we haven't what part spoken about it. Uh, he's an so atheist. Much. He's an atheist. Uh, okay. Right. So it bothered him. And the thing is, I don't even mind that perspective. I understand that perspective too. But at the time I didn't have an experience where I, I, I would say that it included the whole thing. For me, it was like Godhead, right, at that time. So I remember telling him that. I remember him hanging up the phone, say, this is bullshit, whatever, whatever. He just thought you were and nuts. Yeah, you hung up the phone. We never spoke again, wow. right? So this is now how many years? Yeah, so um, uh, I remember telling another coworker at another organization. We still talk to this very day. I remember telling him and uh, another coworker, which is also a friend of mine, overheard it, overheard the conversation. And he's a Christian and he was pissed <laughs> when he heard whatever I was saying to uh, the coworker, right? Because I was telling the coworker I had the experience that I was God and Christianity, uh, okay. that's, that's yeah, blasphemy. Yeah. You can't say Probably those types of things, right? In a lot of religions, right? Yeah. So my, my, the other coworker overheard this and he was upset. Uh, so I was like, okay, I got to go about this a little differently, right? Yeah. So later on, um, I tried to see if I can uh, duplicate that experience and it never happened again for about two years. So nothing happened for two years. Um, even if I did the shrooms with, with the, with the, with the meditation, um, I still didn't, I, I wasn't even able to produce those, ex, those type of results in any way, shape or form. Two years later, it happened again. 
and then it happened again. Well, in the interim, you still felt the benefits of the first. Oh time, yeah, though? I was still, still the perspective. Okay. Never, I never, I never shook that perspective. It didn't fade. It didn't fade. It was always there. There were certain things that didn't connect yet. Like sometimes, if I'm having a conversation, I'd still refer to God as some, someone being outside of me at that point. Um, but as time went on, it started to become more uh, integrated into this one thing. Hmm. So two years later, it happened again. Uh, and then it happened again, and then it happened without entheogens, and then it happened. Yeah, it happened in different ways and in whatever. And then after that, um, I was I was so intrigued by the by what was taking place. Um, and after at this point now, two years in, I started coming up with a lot of spiritual insights. So it was just pouring out of my skull. I was just having insight after insight. And I would write them down and I would post them on like social philosophical media, philosophical wondering. statements, and okay. yeah, uh, things that I just I came to realize. So it that lasted for years. And so I would just make these posts and that would lead into something else I'll probably get into. So I would, I would do all that. And then the experience, as I said, happened again and again and again. And then, um, I met uh, a group of people. Um, I got for the sake of, um, of, uh, of, of privacy and discretion, and all that stuff. I'm not going to get into who these people are, sure, but yeah, a group we don't of people names. who I got in that I, uh, became associated with and someone in the group had access to, um, to NDMT. Right. Mm -hmm. And at this point, I've never tried an NDMT. I was going to ask you, actually, if you've done an ayahuasca <laughs> yeah. trip or something. Ayahuasca, never even tried it at that point. Um, and all the other stuff, never tried. All I've ever tried was was uh, weed and shrooms at this, at this point. So this person, but I did read about DMT. I knew all about it. I just never tried it myself. So this person... Uh, it's not that easy to come by, right? Not easy to come yeah. by, right? But somehow this person had it, right? So... Um, we ended up trying it. We ended up trying to see what would happen. And remember, at this point, I'm, how many years of brainwave entrainment have I done at this point? <laughs> so I tried this DMT and wow. So I've heard. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was totally, it wasn't, an, it wasn't an awakening. It wasn't, it wasn't anything like that. But it was the first time, as, as you may know about an NDMT, it's the most visual psychedelic. Everything's fractals, I hear, and geometric patterns. Well, that's, that's the least of it. <laughs> well, some people say they're visited by these beings. and That could happen. Okay. Yeah, that could happen. Yeah, some, a lot people, of these some people claim they're like transported to completely different realities. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that happens. Everything yeah. is different. That happens. You get you get beamed into, you transport to, into a different uh, um, a 3D dimensional world. And there's many of them. There, there are many of these dimensional worlds in different ways and different. It's it's absolutely. So, but I mean, yet. I suppose the skeptic would say that, like, well, maybe that's just the effect of the drain, uh, the drug on your brain. And does that mean you're actually going to those places, or is it just? And and who cares? <laughs> well, it's, it's all consciousness. Yeah. If a reality comes off and feels like a reality, I don't care if it's real or not. <laughs> well, yeah, <laughs> because point. who's to say this reality yeah, is real, right? Right. Yeah. Because yeah. yeah, a lot of people bring up that argument. It's like that's that's like guys. That's not the point. The point is you. Have have an experience and the experience is real yeah right that's so, true yeah. yeah so it's like i believe that uh, all those chemicals are happening in the brain you're releasing more dimethyltryptamine and you're releasing uh serotonin all that stuff i believe to be true but we're doing that right now too <laughs> yeah for me to have an experience of any kind these neurotransmitters have to be firing off for me to have this experience if all that stuff ceased to exist i this wouldn't happen yeah well, at least i wouldn't perceive it that way right so um you know, it's just you're you're producing, you're releasing probably much more of that, especially with um, dimethyltryptamine, which is DMT, which you have naturally in your body, within your pineal gland. You have it in your lungs. You have it in your spinal fluid. But, of, but releasing it is yeah, the tricky part. It's the I tricky guess. part, uh, and which you can do through breathing techniques. That's another thing I did. I, I, I've done a lot of um, um, breath work as well. That's a, one of the techniques I forgot to mention earlier. So I did a lot of breath work. That's as one well, of the staples of meditation, I would say, right? E, e, yes, but there is kind of the first step e, if you're learning to meditate is breathing in through your nose, out through the mouth, kind of stereotypically, yes. Okay, yeah, but yeah, there well, are many, I, there are many I'm techniques. I'm the layman's when it comes to this stuff for sure. Like, <laughs> yeah, that. there are many techniques where um, you're always breathing, of course, but breathing is not the main focus of the meditation. It could be um, remembering a mantra, counting in your head. Um, things of that sort, or trying to blank everything out of your mind, that type of stuff. That's the one I hear the most. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But these are just these are just there's there's like a million different ways to meditate, hmm. and yeah, they all have different effects to some degree. Yeah, but breathing is, and of course, breathing breath work has its own category of all the different type of techniques that comes within the breathing um, with breath work. Um, but with breath work, you can release DMT as well. Yeah, but oh, it's just harder to do. So if you're doing breath work for 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 a period of time, you can release um, the amount of uh, DMT within the body. 
right? But to, and I'll, I'll probably get back to that if I can. I'll try to. Um, because the story is so long, we'll try to condense it. <laughs> no, no. Because it's such a long story. I right? totally understand. It's You're 20 to years. Tell. Yeah, exactly. It's <laughs> right? a long time. 20 years, right? So um, so I, I'm doing this DMT thing for the first time, right? And uh, the first time we did it, I didn't have a breakthrough. But, I, but that experience was still ex, it was still extraordinary. But it wasn't a breakthrough according to the person that was, um, that was um, facilitating the, the actual session. Was it ever scary or too intense with DMT? Cause I've oh, yeah, it, it can get yeah. there. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. But it wasn't, I didn't find it scary on, on the first try. And the second try, it's not that I found it scary. It was just so extraordinary. I just couldn't. It, it was overwhelming. Um, because in this experience, and I've told this before on po- other podcasts, um, but um, and I'm going to cut it short only because there's so many parts to this. But what mainly happened was I was uh, I encountered a being the size of the CN Tower. And this being was made up of thousands and thousands and thousands of other beings. And um, all these beings had not humans, arms crossed. No. Not human. They were all dimensional, uh, third, di- fourth dimensional beings. Um, but there were all thousands of them, and, but they were all lined up and they had their arms crossed like this and they were singing the sacred sound like, ah, out of their mouths, thousands and thousands of these beings. But the whole, this giant being was made up of all these, these beings, but the giant being itself had dreadlocks coming out of its head and each, and each, each dreadlock was also made up of the beings, but there had eyes in them coming down each dreadlock, each lock, oh. just eyes, just aligned with each other coming all the way down and then the, the arms were like the tree branches and they were intertwined with each other and in within each branch that were intertwined also had beings wow. aligned within each branch as they were intertwined making up the arms and in the legs was the roots of this tree like being and within the roots same thing all the roots were were uh, aligned with these beings that were singing oh <laughs> and sounds it, it, a little scary yeah it's it's it was it was crazy it was insane and what did and, this um, being want didn't want anything uh, it just sat there in a lotus pose and it was doing the mudra this is what we call the hand gestures this is another form of people what people use in meditation or mudras okay. so it was doing the a mudra while doing a lotus pose with the dreadlocks coming down out of his head like tree branches but with the eyes and the beings all intertwined within them and it just looked at me just it, it noticed me and out of curiosity it just looked at me and I looked up at, at this being, I burst out into tears and all the tears that was flowing down my face went and uh, uh, traveled down uh, into the, the roots of, the, of this being and it absorbed into the roots and then I slowly dissolved and d- absorbed into the roots and that's when I came out of the experience. And when I came out of the experience, this was taking place outside. I got up because it was in my, um, my uh, friend's car vehicle with the guy that was there, his vehicle. I ran down, I, I remember popping out of the car, running down the street, crying and, and screaming. Tear, it, I was just crying tears of joy and just screaming down the street. I just sat there for an hour and just cried for about an hour. Just such a And it was like, there was about like 25 of us watching this go down. And did other people that were doing this with you have similar experiences? No, one, none no. of them. <laughs> well, they probably hadn't put in all work. Yeah, they hadn't put in all that type of work. They had yeah. their own extraordinary experiences, but nothing like what, after sharing our experiences, I haven't met anyone in, in real life, in person, uh, to have that type of experience. But I've met people online and okay. in uh, these communities who, who have. But in person, I haven't met a single soul um, that took it to that degree. Hmm. Because everyone was saying, "Why is he? What's wrong with this guy?" Yeah. <laughs> right? They were they were like, "Oh my god, it was a crazy experience." And I'm here like, "Ah, what the fuck?" You, well, yeah, you can't <laughs> so, comprehend what just happened to you, probably. Yeah, it your was, human it was, brain is trying to is trying to. Yeah, it was it was just that extraordinary. So then the new thing was, let's see what happens by uh, experimenting with NNDMT with uh, with the different doses and all that type of stuff. So I have them all mapped down. So the uh, the shrooms stuff mapped down. The regular uh, brainwave entrainment stuff mapped down to what happens when you're doing your daily meditation. So I had the shroom stuff mapped down, had the and, and DMT stuff mapped down. And then this months- is what I think I found so intriguing about this is for something that's so spiritual, you're really treating it like a science. As oh, yeah, well, yeah. Which is- that science is my is, yeah. is, is my thing. So I said, then, you know, let me get a little fringe here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but science is my thing. I love psychology. I love science. I always wanted to be a scientist when I was a kid, but I was really, really bad in science class. Well, and as I said to you outside, yeah. in, uh, when you're talking about this sort of thing, I think that that does lend credibility to you. People might be more willing to hear you out because they're like, <laughs> okay, this is 
got some some stuff rooted in our reality as well you yeah know, i'm we still were. rooted i'm still i look at what's happening in in the brain i look and it's how that relates to the experiences that we're claiming that we're having all of that so i don't i don't i don't um exclude the other yeah i i i, I always have to blend both together because something is happening within the brain that it's allowing us at least to perceive it from the reality that we're having it but when you have the experience itself can can neurotransmitters explain um, the experience itself, um, the, the, what's the word that they call it? The, um, the, um, uh, what's the term? Uh, why is it, it's not coming to me right now? I, I'm probably going, the word is, it's going to come to me in a second. Yeah. It's going to come to me in a second, but there's something that happens within the experience that is like, as much as, uh, these neurotransmitters are doing what it's doing to allow you to have this experience, it doesn't explain the experience itself of what you're feeling out of the experience itself. What's the word? Gosh, it will come to me. Um, so there's so, so much we don't know about yeah. the brain though. Even top brain Even specialists will say that still can't figure it out. Right. Yeah. So I try to take everything to, to account. So I, I would look at psychology, transpersonal psychology. I would look at physics. I look at metaphysics. I would look at, uh, astrophysics. I would look at, um, uh, um, neurology. I would look at all these things and try to find pieces that things I can piece together. Hmm. So, and also, I would also do this under certain experience, uh, experiments as well. So as I'm doing certain experiments, I'm also trying to see what would happen if I have this thought, what would happen, and if I can um, if I can repeat that particular task that I'm doing. There's all these different things You're I would cataloging do. Cataloging everything. Yeah, I would catalog everything, because the next step was LSD. Okay. All right, so now this is where it gets really interesting. So, interesting, because I would have thought that DMT was more profound psychedelically than than acid would be, but I guess it's different I, for everyone. As I, well. I, I, no, well, let's hear it. Yeah, I'm, I'm I, strapped I, in. I, I, I still, I, I'm still debating it. I'm still <laughs> debating of which one's more They're both out there okay. more profound. I have one that that will take out all those things altogether. I'll get there soon, but I, I still can't. I, uh, more intense than a CN tower sized being <laughs> made out of smaller beings well, and eyeballs. But again, when you do in brainwave entrainment, especially low carrier frequency brainwave entrainment, it can produce this type of the type of stuff that I'm speaking of in regards to when you combine it with an NDMT. Mm. But something else happens when you combine it with LSD. So for those for people that don't know who've never tried LSD, because there's a lot of people who are afraid to try it. Yeah. LSD is uh, is 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 an entheogen that um, people will call that like the the psychological microscope. Mm. Um, because you get to look, go within and you can look at your dark shadows. You can look at the, the anima and the animus. You can look at the id. You can look at the different aspects of the ego. You can do all this stuff on LSD. But what happens even that's more profound is when you do it with low frequency um, brainwave entrainment. So with low frequency brainwave entrainment, it becomes so detailed of what you're looking at that it's, it, you, can look at the, you can look at the most... You can look at the most ugly thing that you can ever think of, and you can find the beauty in that when, while, while on LSD. So while on LSD, and I've had conversations with many people who have taken LSD, and everyone says, what the hell? What are you talking about? That's not what happens on LSD. <laughs> but they're right? not doing the brainwave stuff. Yeah, they're not doing the brainwave stuff, right? Um, but with LSD, um, I experienced all like human um, atrocities. On LSD, I have experienced all natural disasters and, and everything, and finding the beauty in all those things, wow. as, as happening on LSD. I've looked within, deep within my soul, through, throughout the human psyche. I can go back. I, I I've went, I've gone so far with LSD to the point at the moment of conception, and looking at what happened when I was conceived, all the way up becoming a fetus, and all the way um, becoming to the point where I'm being birthed. And I remember being birthed. That's intense. <laughs> the grossest. One of the grossest experiences you can imagine thinking yourself as an adult coming out through your mom. Like that's not <laughs> it's something, not. <laughs> especially now that you have all the other associations with women um, uh, uh, as sexual beings, but also as nurturing mothers and all that stuff. So all that stuff is, is, is in your psyche at this point. And you're having this experience being birthed out of your own mom. People don't understand how gross that is. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right. But I remember this. Right. And that happened through the LSD experience. So when people ask me, which one's more powerful, LSD or DMT, it depends on what you're talking about. Yeah. Because DMT is the most visual profound thing. Because DMT, if I've met aliens, like full blown grays. Which on, apparently on, on is DMT. common, I've heard with DMT. That yeah. A lot of people have. And when I, when I say real, I'm talking about I can touch their skin and feel their skin just like I'm feeling mine. Of course, of a different texture. That's how real 
DMT can get with brainwave entrainment. With LSD, you can get into the experience of being other people, of experiencing the whole collective uh, consciousness, um, all at once simultaneously. You can experience all animals, all creatures, uh, all um, microscopic, microscopic creatures. Memories that you thought you, were lost. You can clearly. experience memories that, that were lost, not only your memories, but your memories of your parents and your grandparents and your great, great grandparents. In my case, all the way down to slavery, even before slavery, all the way down to the civilization, the African civilization. I can remember the pyramids. I can remember all of that. Yeah, that's how Holy far this stuff goes. Yeah, people don't understand. I can go all the way down to being a single, a single cell. Now people say, well, that's an imagination. I'm like, regardless. I'm talking about an imagination that's so, that seems so real. Yeah. It's going to change you as a human being. <laughs> yeah, even if it's just an experience, yeah. Even if it's just an hallucination, it, from that to that degree, it's going to change you, right? Yeah. I have experienced, I have experienced um, um, what will happen, what will possibly happen in the future, what will happen with mankind as it becomes more integrated. I have experienced uh, the, um, uh, the one, the one government that will take place, a global government, uh, where all this stuff becomes integrated. I experienced all of that. I experienced what would happen when, pe- when if human starts to travel in outer space. All of that I've experienced. Um, are you convinced those are all things that will happen, or more just things that could happen? Well, I'd say for being still being trying to be logical at the same time. Yeah, I look at it as things that could possibly happen. Yeah, because yeah. you're not convinced it's it's for sure. Uh, yeah, I'm not convinced okay. it's for sure, but it's probably one of the experiences that I'm, I'm able to drum up with all the whatever knowledge and whatever uh, experiences that I have, because you, you are pulling from past experiences, right? So I know that you're pulling from all that and you're making up something based on your ideal of something or uh, something that you wish to happen. So that could be a part of that too. So it's hard for me to say if that's the future, but I can say that your brain can produce that type of thing. Your brain can produce utopia. <laughs> Is utopia real? Will that ever happen? I doubt it. But your brain can produce it. Yeah. So I've done all that stuff with, with, LS, with LSD. And, we, and I've done many sessions with LSD to the point of having different types of spiritual awakenings, like the natural spiritual awakening, the deity spiritual awakening, um, the causal spiritual awakening, um, tiri, a tiria, a, a spiritual awakening, but never tiria tita. Tiria tita is the non-dual experience. Now, throughout the whole time, I'm saying, and, I'm, and at this point, I'm already, I'm teaching spirituality, and I'm talking about the non-dual experience. So I, I shouldn't say that I've never had the non-dual experience because I can speak about this with 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 conviction. But I had to think twice about that once I tried five meo DMT. Now, with five meo DMT, it transcended all my shrooms experiences, all my natural meditation experiences, all my DMT experiences, and all my LSD experiences all in one and more. This is the big one. This this is one of the big ones. One of, okay. I thought it was the big one. <laughs> well, at the time it was, I guess. Right? I thought it was the big the big one, but when I uh, once I, once I experimented with 5 meal DMT, which was through an actual respected um, practitioner, um, I went, holy shit. This is the part where I experienced what they call Brahan. Um, in in Hinduism, in English, you'd say Brahman, but uh, it's Brahan. And that's when I experienced what it really truly meant to be the ground of all being, God itself. Wow. Uh, So all the other experiences I had were just fractions of what I looked at as being God. There's there's even more than that. And that experience with 5MEO surpassed all those things and more in one shot. Huh. Right. So it got to the point where I started to experiment with 5-MEO DMT. But of course, with 5-MEO DMT, I'm sorry, I missed ayahuasca. Ayahuasca is oh, in well. there too. I went and I would meet with the, sh- I met with the shaman 12 times and did ayahuasca and it had its own <sighs> profound experiences on its own. I won't get into it now because it's just going to take it too was long. unique though. Yeah, but they were very unique within themselves. So you had the LSD, sorry, you had the, the psilocybin, LSD, uh, NNDMT, um, and of course, ayahuasca is NNDMT and, and DMT is in ayahuasca and then the 5-MEO um, experience. And then after that, uh, I met with uh, a spiritual, a spiritual um, um, guru. His name is Paramahamsa Vishwananda. So uh, he's a guy who lives out. Yeah. Paramahamsa Vishwananda is a spiritual guru out of Germany. Now say it. He lives in Germany. Paramahamsa Vishwananda, Paramahamsa Vishwananda, Paramahamsa Vishwananda. (laughs) Aced it. (laughs) So I met with him. He came to Toronto one time and I met with him. And what he does, he gives you something that they call Darshan. Darshan is like a, a spiritual blessing that he gives you. So whatever that you're wishing for, 
um, you don't have to tell him. You just wish you have an intention. And then he looks into your eyes for 20 seconds and he puts his hand on your head for 20 seconds and he lets you go about your way. So um, in September of, of 2019, I met with this guy and um, waited for hours in this ceremony. Um, and I went alone because I was, I was trying to get other people to come with me. But my group of people, it's like, you know, you go first. <laughs> you let us know what happens and then you can call us in, right? So it takes a while to convince these guys, right? So I went, I went alone, waited in this long line for, for a period of time. And then finally, I, I got to meet with Paramahamsa Vishwananda. And uh, he looked into my eyes for 20 seconds, rest his hands on my head, and he sent me about my way. What happens is when I, when I walked away, um, my body started twitching. There was parts of my body, like my hands and my neck and my chest started um, tw twitching on its own accord, uh, doing all these strange things. And I realized that something was happening because those same type of things happened when I did 5-MeO DMT, hmm. right? So for five, and that's called Kriya. So this is when your body will start to do hand mudras on its own. It would do, um, you would have these uh, seizures and you would have these, uh, these outbreaks in, in, in different ways with the body. And it would happen for months. So with 5-MeO DMT, I would have these experiences where my hands would just go up on its own. My face would make these gestures on its own, like these happy face gestures. And there was times where I had to hide myself. I'd be in public. I was going to say, that uh, could complicate your life. It, it could. It, it can't. Well, I was lucky, but because um, it always happened. Most of the times it happened when there was no one around. But I would just say if I'm in the parking lot, my face. I remember one time, one of my youth, he needed money. And of course, as a youth worker, you're not supposed to uh, cross those boundaries. But this guy needed money. He helped me out in the past. One time I needed a ride. He gave me a ride and hit me up. He says, hey, do you happen to have $20? Someone stole my wallet and blah, 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 blah. I said, you know what? Let me, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to e-transfer you 20 bucks. As I'm trying to make the e-transfer, my face on its own without my intention just went. Okay. And I went, what the f <laughs> Right? <laughs> yeah. I was trying to hide my face because I was like, oh my God, I, why, am I, why am I doing this? I had to run behind a car and just kind of creep down behind a car and allow the expression to happen. And then it slowly dissipated. And you and attribute left. this to that blessing? No, no, this is, this oh, is, okay. this is prior to meeting. This is with the five MEO. Oh, Cause okay. a lot of the okay. similar, similar stuff happened with five MEO that happened with meeting this, this, this man. Okay. Right. So these are the things that were happening when I was doing five MEO DMT. Right. So I was like, oh my gosh, this is incredible. All these things, my hands would go up and it would do these mudras. You were worried or scared that you had tweaks because, because again, in your brain. And... Again, I'm, at this point, I'm 16 years into it. Yeah, that's right? fair. I've gone to how many uh, set, uh, uh, how many uh, um, workshops and how many retreats and how many ceremonies and read how many books and... And you've had all these other experiences. And had all already. these other experiences. Yeah. But at this point, none of that stuff even scared me. Mm. Um, it was at the point where I'd be sleeping at night and then I wake up in the seizure and my body would be just jerking like that. Oh. And I can't stop it for like five minutes. That one didn't end in a wet dream? No, I'm sorry. No, no, <laughs> no. Actually, you know what? Now that you mentioned the wet dream, I'm going to throw this in real quick. Mm. Um, when I was practice, practicing the Qigong uh, techniques, when I was practicing, there was, a, there was a technique that you practice to learn how to prolong sex and to, and to, get, your, to get yourself to, to produce a full body orgasm. So it's like a tantric thing kind of, yeah, it's like okay. tantric sex, but it's like, it's, but it's from the, the Qigong standpoint, right? I practice these techniques for about two weeks and then maybe even less than that, but this is going back 2006, this happened, right? So I'm, I'm going back to 2006 again. So I wake up one morning, I'm having a full blown, full blown body orgasm from head to toe. So this is not just a genital orgasm. This is happening from head to just toe. Just ecstasy completely. It feels like every cell in your body is bussing juice. <laughs> 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 the most incredible sex I've ever had up to that point with no partner. Wow. It lasted for four hours. Imagine having a full body orgasm for four hours. I don't know that I'd sign up for that, to be honest. <laughs> sign me up. Four minutes? Yeah. <laughs> four hours? I don't know. Yeah. Four hours long. Well, the lasted. one thing I would actually worry in a situation like that is would that then sort of taint sex moving forward? Because I've heard things that like... My, it does. I a, yeah. I had a friend <laughs> who... Compared even, to that, right? It does. It even does. just doing MDMA, I know a guy who was doing that too frequently. And then he found... He confessed to me that a lot of things he previously would find joy in just no longer no, no, compared no, to yeah. that state of existence that he found himself in previously. Yeah, you know? it, does, it, does, it definitely did that with me, to me. So um, doesn't that kind of suck then? Because then does, you're going to be chasing it, it, that? It does suck. <laughs> <laughs> it does suck to a degree. And, yeah. and, and But it also at the same time, you're less detached mm. now at this point. 
So most times it doesn't matter. And there's other times I have to admit where it does matter. I'm like, oh man, this this sucks, man. (laughs) I can't enjoy it the way I would like to enjoy it because I'm comparing it to that experience. And I had other experience even more powerful than that one. Um, That that, that was my first sexual uh, spiritual experience, but I had two others that surpassed that. It just wasn't as long. Mm. It was the same thing without a partner. Uh, Without a partner, Uh, but it was more. But they weren't full body orgasms. It was more the actual sexual acts, but internally. Oh, wow. Yeah, but it wasn't the full body orgasm. That was the only time I had the full body orgasm. The other two times was having the internal sexual uh, experience without a partner. Hmm. Yeah, type of thing. I wonder if if two people are are equally trained in this kind of thing, if they could have some sort of communal yeah, you, you can't crazy do that. orgasm. You can't I guess do that's that. what yeah. tantric... That would be the goal. So the goal is that the, both people would practice on their own, and then you come together at some point to to create union between... Just have the best the, sex yeah, ever. <laughs> between two partners. Yeah, so that would be the goal. Okay. But of course... Um, finding a partner who's experiencing that is very difficult to find. So yeah, <laughs> I've never experienced that. That does not surprise me. Uh, yeah. But then, then going back to Paramahamsa Vishwananda, all right, I go see this guy. He looks into my eyes for 20 seconds, rests his, puts his hand on my head. And people, of course, everyone says, oh, come on, you know, uh, that's what you wanted to it's happen. It's a placebo whatever. effect. It's a placebo something. effect. Yeah. And I'm like, hey, I'm fine with that. <laughs> I'll take it. Yeah. Well, as long as it leads to the result, right? As so long as I'm clocking those four-hour <laughs> orgasms. <organizers. laughs> yeah, whatever is actually going on in the body, I'm fine with that. Yeah. I'm, I'm just talking about the experience itself, right? So he does what he does, whatever. I go about my way. I'm feeling the twitches. I'm feeling the, the stuff I felt with the 5-MeO DMT, um, the after effects of 5-MeO DMT. And I went, whoa, that was crazy. Went about my way. Continued doing my meditations uh, and all that. And then... Um, one day I ended up having another spiritual awakening experience, right? It blew my mind and I was afraid to have another one. That's how profound it was. But then on December of, 20, of, of 2019, without, without any uh, entheogens or whatever, it happened again. But this time I experienced absolutely everything. Well, this is what I'm saying subjectively. I experienced absolutely that has ever happened in the past, everything that's happening right now in the present and everything that will ever happen in the future, all in one. Uh, I experienced what they called Parabrahan. I experienced Nirvana, Muksha, Bodhi, any name that you can come up with. All of that was experienced. Satchitananda, which means uh, bliss, consciousness, and existence. All of that was experienced all in one. I experienced every grain of sand. I experienced every br- blade of grass. I experienced every every cloud. I experienced what about other every dirt and stuff like every that. Every planet, every solar system, every galaxy, every human being. How can every, your brain like handle that? You know. Well, you, it doesn't because at this point, it messes you it's up. It's beyond the it's beyond the brain. Yeah. Right. Because you're experiencing all brains. Right. At this point, so you're experiencing every. Oh, sorry. I, I guess I should say when you come come down from that experience or sort of come back to this reality. Is it not burdensome to carry around that? I'll, I'll get into yeah. that. I'll go into that because I have to be truly honest. So what for me, what happens after something like that? All right. But I'll, I'll get into that. If I forget, just remind me. Sure. Yeah. Um, so all of that was experienced. I experienced I experienced um, all my reincarnations. I experienced all your reincarnations, everyone's reincarnations, all the way up from the beginning of time, all the way to the ending of time. I experienced uh, the, the birth and the destruction of the entire universe itself. I've experienced every uh, Is birth. Is the destruction the birth? That's one thing I've always yes. wondered about. Is the Big Bang also the, the big bang boom. that takes? Okay. <laughs> I, I think a lot of people have posited that as a yeah, theory. Yeah, it's a, but it's real, it's real, but it's not the only thing that's, that's uh, there's, uh, it's a matter of uh, people's perspective and how they, everyone has, um, has the right idea of, of the actual thing. It's just no one's brain can comprehend the whole thing, so it's broken up into parts. So even among scientists, all the theories that they have about the Big Bang, um, they're true to some degree. It just depends on how you're um, interpreting the information. Hmm. Right, so they're all happening. They're all happening. The big crunch, the big, the well, that, big crunch, the big, the big expansion, that's true. That's how I sort of, because I've definitely been someone who has, I would say stressed or worried about like, well, what is life? What is death? What comes after all that stuff? And yeah. that's something that brings me a little bit of peace is to just sort of go, whatever's next, like my physical body and brain just cannot comprehend it. You can't comprehend and when it. you die yeah. or, or move on, all of a sudden it'll be like you, you speak that language now yeah. or, or you're putting those glasses on and you can see clearly. I like the idea of that. So the, what I would say to that is as much as your brain can't comprehend it, Remember, in this experience, you're beyond the brain. You're beyond mind. You're beyond your individual mind because now you are consciousness. You're the conscious mind. The soul, so, so to speak, or 
all souls combined. Oh, okay. Yeah. So that you can call it spirit. Soul. If you're, if you're gonna if you're gonna use these terms, right? Collective so you can say soul. collective soul. <laughs> That's a great band. <laughs> great band, right? Yeah. <laughs> so you can call it the collective soul, and you can call the whole thing spirit if you want to call it that, or you can call, call it uh, God, call it Brahman, call it. Uh, Prabrahan, whatever name that you can call it, um, you can call it uh, um, Jehovah. You can call it whatever name you whatever want to call suits it. You really. Whatever suits you. Whatever, yeah. And um, so all of that is happening simultaneously. So what's happening in this experience? Remember, I said I'm experiencing past, present, and future. You're experiencing past, present, and future simultaneously. So past is still happening right now. Future, of course, the present's happening right now because everything's always been the present. Mm. You're just moving what you call within time as the present moment as it moves within what you call time and then there's the, the future. So all that stuff is happening simultaneously. So everything that's ever happened in the universe and, and, and could happen in the universe and will happen in the universe is happening right now in the space right now. And that was the experience. Uh, in that moment, not only are you comprehending all of existence, you are comprehension itself. Oh my God. Yeah. So it's not someone comprehending something. You are the comprehension. That's wild. Yeah. And that's what happened in that moment. As I'm experiencing this, I, I don't have, I don't know who I am at this point. Cause I'm everyone at this point. I'm everyone, everything. There's no location. All locations is wiped clean. All there is, is location. If you want to even call it that. <laughs> yeah. Cause there is no me and you over there. There is here and here is there. Up and down is here. Left and right is here. Northwest, e northwest, east and east and south is here. Here is there. Um, inner is outer. Um, other is me, and me is other. Subjective is objective. Spirit is soul. Um, God is man. Man is God. Um, God is planet, solar system, galaxy, universe. But not only universe; it was also multiverses. Alternate universes, all that stuff was all combined, all in one moment. And it was so profound that even what, whatever the smallest length of time is, what is it? Um, like a nanosecond or something? Or is it even less than that? I don't there's know. something less than that. Femto. What is it? <coughs> femto is smaller than a nano. F-E-M-T-O. A femtosecond, would they say? What's smaller what than is that? Is that you the can, smallest? You can, is that the smallest? You can just keep going. It's you can keep going, right? Sure. Whatever the smallest length of time is, was exactly the same as eternity. So there was no distinction between the smallest length of time to what you would call eternity. All of it was one and the same. Yeah. This was so profound that when my ego started coming back into form, um, my body, everything in my body started shaking. It felt like every cell, every uh, molecule, every atom, Every particle, every subatomic particle broke out and said in one voice, in every language, I am God. And now you got to carry that around with you, <laughs> that knowledge. Till this day, I still have it. <laughs> but, but from what I'm hearing, yeah, it's because you got to carry it around with God. you. God. Yeah. And, and this table is God That's and everything right. is God. That's right. Okay. Or, right. or whatever word yeah. you want to use. So even though I'm saying that all, every cell, every molecule, whatever, everything of everything did the exact same thing, did the exact same thing. Hmm. Everything in the entire universe said in at all languages at, at any time yeah. within this time period right now, then and tomorrow, I am God in all languages. And, I'll, 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 and again, can I ask they're not all thing. human languages, right? My brain, my brain is going here. If everything that has happened or will happen or is happening is all oneness, then does anything matter? Like if the future is sort of predetermined because it's already happening right now and the past has already happened, but it's also already happening, then sort of, I guess what everyone would ask, what's the point, you know, like uh, the meaning of life, so to speak, or all that, like, doesn't that confound you even more when you come to that kind of oneness realization is like, are we just going through the motions then? Like, you know, well, remember everything is included, right? So if everything is happening, if everything's already predetermined, Right, which is one way of looking at it, and let's go by what you were asking earlier about uh, personal uh, choice. Right? Yeah, yeah. Personal choice is a real thing within the manifestation, right? So within the manifestation, you are making choices because that's the program. <laughs> if you want to look at it that way, okay. you are you are making choices. All that stuff are true. If you if I if I pick up this book, and I'm doing this for a shameless plug, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. right? Get it in the it, it leads to cause and effect. This is a cause and the effect is I put the book down. 
if I put the book down, you looked at the book, that's a, that's another effect. You looking at the book is now a cause. And what happens after that is the effect. All of that is happening, right? Because cause and effect is also included. But in that moment of what you call absolute monism, all of it is happening right now. So every perspective, every choice has ever been made. Um, does that include every, every idea that could have ever been made, but wasn't? Yep. That's also included. That's the alternate realities yeah, and stuff. That's, okay. Yeah. That's also included. And that's kind of quantum physics stuff. Is it not like all that stuff you got to include too. You yeah. got to include quantum physics. You got to in- include every, you got to include everything. You have to include all form of mathematics. You have to include every sport. You have to include every movie that's ever been made and every movie that's ever been thought of and every movie that's been thrown in the, in the, in the can. Yeah. You got to include that too. You got to include every oh, pair I just of meant, shoes. I meant quantum physics in the sense that I've heard quantum physics stuff where they talk about um, all the sort of anytime you make a choice, oh, the, I the see. opposite choice that you didn't made was also made in a different oh, reality by a different version made of made in you. another reality. Yeah. yeah. So that idea um, is also included in in this whole, hmm. this whole whatever. So even every idea, even the ideas that aren't true, it's still an idea. The idea is true. This probably just hasn't played out in reality. But if someone thought of it, that's also included in the experience. This makes me think of that uh, that flick that just won a bunch of awards everything everywhere all at once have you seen that i was actually disappointed after watching that because i, I it was had, a little goofy i yeah, thought it was goofy but I, I i need to watch that movie before having that experience <laughs> <laughs> so it ruined it for me yeah, fair. <laughs> but i watched it i watched it, it was the a hot good movie dog fingers and... yeah I, I, that i hated i hated the yeah. hot dog finger i thought it was silly it was a but um the, i liked the concept of the movie yeah but after here. after having an experience like that everything i see is kind of mundane at this point right but not a bad not in a bad way i just see everything as huh but to someone who hasn't had those experiences, a movie like that really could kind of shift the way oh, you yeah. think about oh, yeah. things. If I watched that movie uh, prior to having any of those, it, it probably would have motivated me or inspired me to to that want curiosity. to yeah to want to explore that. Yeah, most definitely. You kind of felt the same about that movie, right? That you were kind of lukewarm on it. I thought yeah. you didn't hate it, but yeah, it didn't was... hate it, didn't love it. <laughs> That's kind of what I thought. Like, I, yeah, I didn't yeah. think it was a garbage movie. But... Yeah, I didn't think it was garbage. I no, didn't think it was garbage. I actually watched the first half of the movie. And then I was totally lost interest in it. I thought this is not a good way to spend my time. <laughs> but then, uh, and everyone was raving about it, right? So that's what I was thinking. But then uh, a few weeks later, um, your mom wanted to see it. And so I watched it again. And I don't know if it's like a lot of things, you absorb more out yeah, of it the second viewing. And I followed it through a little bit better, but... Mm the hot dog fingers and things like that. Yeah. Like, I get past you know, that. Yeah. yeah you should have left that. Out. I think that was supposed to be just an extreme example of like, if every reality exists, so does this one. Like, I think that's what they were why, going for. Why that one? Well, but that's exactly it. Yeah. Cause yeah. anything you could conceive could, could has happen. happened or is happening or is somewhere. Happening somewhere. Yeah. 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 So I get what they're going for, but I think, yeah, it made it very yeah. feel like a farce a little bit at that yeah. point. Yeah. I, I, I wish it was directed differently. Because, yeah. I, I, again, I love the concept of it, but it was like... Uh, I, I liked that they were doing something I had never seen in a movie before, at least. It, it felt yeah. innovative in that sense. Yeah, oh yeah. It wasn't oh like yeah. another reboot of the no. Ghostbusters or something, you know? No. Well, yeah. yeah. I could not bring that up with everything we're talking about. It seemed very <laughs> relevant to a degree. Uh, one thing I've been wanting to mention, too, a couple of things, actually. When you were talking about the tingle in, in the top of your head, it reminded me of a feeling I've had a few times, and not really... I guess I would say sometimes, I don't meditate a lot, but... Uh, sometimes on substances too, if I feel like I'm I'm kind of out of it or whatever, and I close my eyes, I've had like a tingling like right in my forehead here. Yeah. That has also happened if I've ever taken like a a pen or a pencil or something that could presumably harm me and held it near there, it like tingles like crazy. Oh yeah, and, interesting. And also, I get that same feeling when when I'm um, when I used to have like a therapist as a teen. Whenever someone is really um, not, not focus. I guess focusing on me when, when there's a one-on-one experience like that, where someone is really invested in, in getting to know me or, or something like that. Therapy is the one that comes to mind. Mm-hmm. I, I would have that same kind of a interest tingling in my forehead, but so it's tingling where, where in your forehead, it's like right here. Yeah. So that'd be your, yeah. It'd be, uh, um, associated with your, uh, um, third eye chakra. That's, a, that's okay. Kind of what I was thinking after you were talking about the chakras, yeah. chakras, I don't know a lot about, but I'm certainly not someone that would, um, you know, say, oh, that's ridiculous, because I, I think we do that in modern culture, that there's these practices from thousands of years and yeah, they, multiple parts of the yeah, planet. And then we go mean something. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I, I'm, I'm someone who, you know, I, I try to have a healthy amount of skepticism with anything, of whether course. it's Sasquatch or, or the stuff we're talking about here. But I also yeah. would never close these ideas out either, because oh, yeah. if enough people are talking about them, there's got to be a reason. There's got to be know? something there. Yeah. So it's enough for me to explore them, even though I didn't, I've never 
try to explore Bigfoot and all that type of stuff. But <laughs> I used yeah, to love uh, the paranormal in, in any form, really, cryptozoology, yeah. all that stuff. When I was younger, I did. Loch Ness yeah. Monster and, oh, and all that type of stuff, right? <laughs> Ghosts, whatever it is. And on know? some level, they still intrigue me. Same here. Yeah. yeah. Or still aliens. Me. I mean, yeah. aliens, you've met them now, so it's probably how Yeah, but, but, the thing is, but the thing is, prior to that, I never cared about exploring that realm. Hmm. Right? I wasn't even intentionally trying to experience that. It's just when it happened, I was like, holy shit. Yeah, I got to think about I'm this actually, now. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm actually talking to two greys right now. Well, I couldn't, I couldn't understand what they're saying, but, uh, yeah. And then after two days after that, I met these, uh, other beings, um, like they were like, they look like praying, they're like giant praying mantis, but wearing, uh, body armor. Whoa. Um, yeah. Like battlefield armor. A sci-fi movie. Yeah. It was, it was strange. They had like, they were like praying mantis, but ant type faces, M- very muscular. Uh, when I say giant, they were probably just like this, like six, five, six, seven. Is size even like relevant in that kind of, cause I know you said the CN tower, but I'm just trying to put myself, I know it's obviously very hard to, to <laughs> give me that experience, but yeah, I would think the way you were describing things, it's such a, you're so far out of what we consider regular reality that yeah. I wouldn't have thought size would even be a thing in that world. You know, yeah, I only mentioned it all because I'm like, they're praying mantis. Yeah. That's yeah, and praying mantis is about, yeah. So that's why oh, I okay, mentioned I the size. They felt yeah. bigger than you felt bigger than me. Okay. Yeah. And, Weird. uh, they were harmless. They just looked at me with curiosity. It was two of them. And, um, so do you think that's just another planet in our universe somewhere? You know what? You got a, a glimpse into? I'm, I'm, I still have, uh, keeping my logical mind, I'm more than willing to say that I made it up in my mind, <laughs> but they were so real. It appeared to be so real. I, I, I can't shake it. I can't shake yeah, this one. So fair I, enough. So it's enough for me to say, um, let me continue to keep reading what the, what the findings are. Just keep seeing what the findings are and see what's going on. Cause I'm like, regardless what's going on, those creatures, those whether they, they were totally 100%, even more real than real, because it was more real and more convincing than this reality. Wow. Right. So I, I don't know what to say about it. I don't know if it's something that's of the psyche, but all I can say is more real than this. I can touch them. This both, I can smell them. I can. Yeah, this makes me want to do DMT, but also totally not want to do it. Like, I'm very <laughs> Be very careful here. Yeah. Be very careful, right? Because yeah, because uh, it, 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 it does have his... Uh, is risks. Uh, yeah. So you got to be careful. When I say uh, they're not terrible and to the point where you're not going to mess yourself up. You'll recover. To that degree. Yeah. But you'll. Yeah. Well, even LSD, there are actual scientific risks. They've proven that um, if people have sort of a, a latent schizophrenia, that those things can that be coerced. Po- yeah. yeah uh, that's possible. That probably you would have gotten eventually anyways, but yeah. it can speed that process up. Yeah. There's other things that could, uh, that could uh, bring that up as well. But yeah, it could do that. So you got to be really careful. You got to be. It's um, not for everybody. Yeah. It's not for everyone, right? I just happen to be the person that um, either is through genetics or through this training of this meditation training. Because at this point, I've done, what, almost 8,000 hours? <sighs> yeah, so at this point, right, so maybe it's, that, it's the training as well. It could be a combination of both. But I've never had a situation where um, I, I sat there and said, oh, my gosh, I'm losing my mind. It's like never. Uh, in, in, the, in the experiences, they have happened because I've also experienced like with the LSD experience, I experienced, um, all form, not, not all forms. I experienced a variety of forms of, um, of, um, of, uh, illnesses, uh, mental illnesses, physical illnesses, like, um, ending up with leprosy, all that type of stuff. I experienced all that stuff. Uh, so in, when, when you're in the experience, I remember saying to myself, holy shit, I hope this is not permanent. I remember saying that. I'm like, oh yeah, my gosh, terrifying. did I fuck myself over on this one? Yeah. And then time goes on and you're back to normal again. So, oh gosh, that was a close one. So that they have happened, but I've never been stuck in any of these. Uh, I like the way you speak about this stuff though, because you're very open about it, but it does sound like you still scrutinize the, the process. Yeah, I still you scrutinize it, yeah, yeah. You're, you sound very yeah. intelligent, very articulated, very, yeah. you know, the only thing I don't question, the only thing I don't question is the self, the oneness. It was so convincing and so whatever I'm convinced on that level, everything else that happens within that, uh, you know, what? So you know what? I need to look into this a little more. I need to see what's going on in that level. But what I can say, regardless what's happening on the, on the physical level or on, on, on when it comes to neurology or, or the uh, physiology is what it does to as a person, because there's things that I'm doing now. Uh, oh, I should also mention that, um, after having the experience in 2008, uh, um, Five months later, I became, I just became a vegetarian. I've never oh. even tried to stop. I just became one. I'm, yeah, now I'm a vegan. vegetarian as well. Yeah. yeah. Now I'm a vegan, but I never made any effort to do that. It's just one of those things that came out of, um, a result of these experiences. That's interesting. Um, I also work with, um, kids with, uh, with, uh, intellectual disabilities. 
I would have never think, done that years ago. It's, it's something I do now because I just feel the need to. That's very um, noble. Yeah, yeah, but I would never, you would never catch me doing that back in the day, especially during the buzz days. I would never do that. But now I do it, I do it all the time. Do you think that uh, the vegan switch, even if it was a subconscious, something you didn't put effort in, do you think that's due to that feeling of oneness with everything made you yeah, know, yeah. like you felt the suffering of the animals? I felt and, the suffering of the animals. I've witnessed every, to every type of torture. Um, I've witnessed human torture. Um, animal torture. I witness even um, stepping on a bug. I witnessed that too. I can feel the sensation of being stepped crunch. on mm. and that crunch and everything. Um, I experienced that. I experienced um, even when someone's walking on the, on the grass, I can feel the grass being pressured, being stepped on. I can feel that. Not in this moment. No, no. But in but that, yeah, I can feel that. In that state. Mm. Yeah. I remember just being a plant and there was a drop of water um, that dropped off the plant and was landing and it was falling to the ground. I can feel I, I can experience myself being the plant and also being the drop of water that's dropping down and hitting the dirt and the dirt splashing. I can feel all of that. Wow. Yeah. These things are so profound that, and in the brain is probably what's put, probably what's happening is using up every memory of sensation I can possibly have. Um, all the five senses, all of that stuff is being used in that moment, regardless what's happening when you have an experience like that, if it doesn't change you, What's the point? Yeah, <laughs> certainly. Right. But yeah, I've done all these things and, um, yeah. And, um, I'm glad you mentioned, um, the five senses. Cause that actually brings me to a question I had written down here, but before I forget, I wanted to say, um, I was listening to a podcast the other day and thinking about this interview coming up and I heard a quote that I found very interesting. I don't know if it's attributed to Buddha or something like that, but it's, it seems to be in effect with you because you clearly have had these experiences and you continue to do your daily meditation and, and stick to that regimen. And, uh, it was, before enlightenment, before enlightenment, chop wood, chop carry, wood water. carry water. After, after enlightenment, enlightenment, chop wood, carry water. Yeah. So you, yeah. you're aware of this. I had never heard that. Have you ever heard that quote? But it yeah. makes sense. You know, it, even once you found enlightenment, it's not like, okay, time to go home. You know, you keep, you keep doing all your human duties, uh, everything that you've done before you continue to do them. I continue to do everything I've done before and after. Uh, I just added a couple more things. And you don't get agitated by things nearly as easily. It sounds like after these kinds of experiences. Yes. But sometimes I do. And that's okay too. You're human. I'm human. Yeah. <laughs> right. So, sometimes so, the guys I work with, uh, with, the, uh, with the guys that I'm working with, with intellectual disability, sometimes they piss me off. Yeah. It could be frustrating. Yeah. It's sure. like, what the fuck, man? <laughs> 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 but it happens, right? I'm, I'm human and I deal with it and I pick myself up and I say, listen, you know, this, this you can't help it. Yeah. Um, what, I, what can I do to support him or her? Yeah. Yeah. What were you going to so, say? Yeah. So, just listening to, I mean, it's amazing. First of all, the amount of exploration that you've done, right? The the and the stick to itiveness, I guess, yeah. of of continue to do it for so many years. I think what I'd like to know from you is, after having experienced everything that you have, um, having this awareness that you have now, how does it? change your life i mean going forward what what material impact has it had on you like you just said you still have to was it uh, chop wood we'll carry, carry water yeah. so you still have to live your life and go through everything and feel the normal things and, uh, but with everything that you've experienced it has to have i mean at, at the very least affected how you view the world of course but is it more than that have you have you changed your whole approach to life because of it? And in what way, what, what ways that materially impacted your, your daily life? And I guess in the be all and end all, um, was it worth it? <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll answer that first. It was totally worth it. <laughs> I had a feeling it's it was totally <laughs> worth it. Uh, but I'll also, I, I, I will also say going through this 20 year journey has also been a very painful one. Very painful, physically, emotionally, mentally, mostly, mostly physically from kidney pains oh, yeah? to, to, um, uh, rapid heartbeats to chronic fatigue on a daily basis, going at this meditating because things happen to the body when you, when you continue with a meditation practice, especially with low carrier frequencies, that's supposed to be the equivalent of how many hours of meditation per day. Right? So all these things starts to happen within the body, which they call Kundalini syndrome. Mm. All right. So very painful stuff. Uh, and I still go through some of this stuff now. And that was never discouraging at any point? Again. <laughs> yeah, it was worth it. <laughs> the stuff, the stuff <laughs> is so incredible. For me, it's worth, it's worth it. Uh, and I've gone through how many pain, like physical pain to the point where I thought I was going to die. 
Well, and one day we will die. And, and one day we will, a lot right? of physical pain, yeah. and you'll be a hell of a lot more prepared for it than <laughs> I will be. <laughs> and that's what meditation does. It prepares you for death, yeah. right? But to answer, to answer your dad's question, um, all I do now is try to help people. Um, of course, I teach, right? So I'm trying to share the knowledge, not necessarily the experiences. I never really talked about the experience much until after appearing on um, uh, Guru Viking. Um, I never really talked about the experience much. I would talk about the teachings, uh, non-dual teaching and stuff like that. Um, but now people are very interested in the experience, right? So I, I, I tell you a little bit of that first and then I can get into some of the teachings, right? So um, I do more of that where I try to in- inspire people uh, as, as I've been doing, like as uh, since I've been meditating, I've been working in a nonprofit organization and been, I've helped man, maybe probably thousands of people at this point, definitely hundreds. <laughs> hundreds upon hundreds, yeah. Help people with uh, with 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 housing and clothing, and and um, and make sure they have food, and providing uh, counseling and support, and all of that. And also, too, my personal time. Even after I finish work, I'm still taking in calls. On and this happens on a weekly basis where people are going through um, whatever stuff that they're going through uh, uh, throughout their personal lives. I drop everything I'm doing. And I take that on, even though I already clocked out. I continue to do that. Um, of course, by me being uh, quote unquote vegan now, I do that because, you know, I just want to do my part in regards to not bringing harm. But at the same time, I also realize that it doesn't matter what I do. I'm still bringing harm. Because you are a part of everything. I'm a part of everything. Not only that, but even just in my personal life, if I'm wearing the shoes that I wear, where did it come from? Um, who produced that shoe? Um, I, I, I'm aware of that. Uh, um well, and how do you view things like, uh, you know, I, I eat fish sometimes, but generally I'm, I'm pretty much a, a no meat person. I haven't had chicken or any of that other stuff in, in a decade. Yeah. But I don't know. I still, uh, I don't know. I still feel like conflicted because I'll see videos of like nature where, you know, brutal death. Oh, yeah. And I force myself to watch it. There's some channels where you'll see stuff like that because it's first of all, it's kind of fascinating. It is. But it's also, you know, I guess to put that reminder in my brain of like this stuff is out there and it's also part of the it universe. Is. And because you know, again, from 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 the from the no self or the, the self, it, it's neutral. Remember, it, it's creating it. It's it's doing it. And not only is it doing it, it is it. So it has no discrimination between good or bad. It just is. Yeah. Right. So all that's still happening. So as much as I may, as an individual, try to make conscious decisions, I'm still aware of all the, the, the contributions I'm making that make that's making things what they are, whether it's, it's, it's good or bad. I still recognize my role within that things that I can't stop. But I try to make a conscious effort to do whatever I can. Yeah. Within whatever, but it's just a dent in the universe. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> whatever really. I'm doing, right? But I just accept the fact that that's what it is. But I do whatever I can as an individual to do what I can to try to make a difference. And so if everyone had that mindset, it wouldn't just be a dent potentially, right? Or probably still would be. Still would in be the grand in the universe. grand universe. Yeah. <laughs> All of Earth is a dent. No, right, I guess. Yeah, right. we're so small in comparison to the rest of the universe. It's yeah. not even. Yeah, it's so it's minute. Mind blowing. Yeah. So like all that is happening. Uh, yeah, so it, it doesn't even matter. It, it is what it is. But um, as an individual, you try to make these individual changes. Does it get you into heaven? No, none of that stuff matters. It, you are in heaven. You are heaven. Yeah, it sounds itself. like there is no you, like um, palace it, in the clouds. There's no, yeah, yeah it's uh, he- heaven is the state. Heaven is nirvana. Heaven is m- moksha. All of us is there now. Actually, it's my second book, which I'm working on now. Is um, Originally, it was called uh, Seeing Paradise. I may name it, uh, rename it to... Uh, uh, awakening paradise. Uh, but that book is about talking about heaven and hell that you're actually in these states. You're actually in heaven and hell or right being now. Being paradise speak. would be. And being paradise yeah. is another way of looking at it. I just think, I just think calling it being paradise would confuse people. It's like, what do you mean? You can't be the location, which you can. Which you can. That's why I thought it'd be <laughs> yeah, a great title. Which you can, but I would have to, I would have to rewrite the, the book. the fucking book before you come <laughs> before you, that. Before you come up with this judgment. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so I may call it awakening uh, paradise. So okay. I'm almost finished uh, rough draft, uh, the final rough draft. Uh, of this uh, of this second book, I've been working on this since 2015. And when you were younger, yeah. did you ever think you would write a book? No, never. No, I N- never, <laughs> never. Even though I wrote a lot of poetry and stuff like that, I never thought that I would be writing books. But my goal is to write 13 of them. I would love to see a, a book on like just your philosophical thoughts. There, there will be one too. Um, okay, that one is going to be called. Um, what did I call that one? That one's going to be called, I uh, uh, can't remember the title of that. I have two, I have three parts to that. I have um, part one, part two, and part three. I just can't remember what I named it. The tip, what did I call it? The tip of my tongue? The tip of my tongue. 
Okay. As it will probably be the name of the, um, the three book series. Yeah. Well, so let, there's let Waking, Waking, Waking Paradise, out. Tip of My Tongue. There's also uh, Swallowing uh, Swallowing Vedanta, which talks about the six different schools of Vedanta. Because uh, I'm part of Advaita Vedanta. So I talk about the other schools of Vedanta and how I would want all these ones, all these schools to be put together as one integral whole. Because they, they have their disagreements with each other, um, the oppositions and stuff like that. My thing is after having um, the experience that I had in, in 2019, um, I can see all the, the schools of Vedanta as being one. I can see all Buddhism, all religions, Christianity, Islam, uh, Hinduism, everything as one whole thing. Uh, and that's just only one speck of, of uh, what Tiriatita is doing. Well, I've never uh, heard of Vedanta, so that's something I'm going to have to Google. Yeah, Advaita Vedanta. Ad, Advaita Vedanta. Advaita just means non-dual. It means um, non-dual means not two. So uh, the whole philosophy in, in uh, Advaita Vedanta meaning not two. Uh, they're not saying everything is one. They're saying everything is not two. All right. So that way it gets out of because when you realize when you have that experience, you realize that one is also a, a concept that we're making up. Singularity is a concept that we're making up. So you have to include the singularity. The lack of that, and so on and so on, to get the full integral uh, 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 perspective of what absolute monism is. And so, when someone has the experience of absolute monism, when you realize what you actually are, you 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 realize that you are the who, what, when, where, why, and the how, all in one simultaneously. And you are the creator of all universes. Yet you are the universe itself, which it's creating because all of that is one. You are the creator, the, the thing that's being created, and the creation itself. All of that becomes one, and it's beyond all space and time. That's and mind. One can have a realization in your lifetime. Any human being can have the realization of what they actually are: the who, the what, the when, the why, the the why, the how, all in one. All people, all animals, all creatures, all. Sp- uh, uh, speck of dust, every bit of stardust, every star in the sky, absolutely everything that you are, all of that and more. And not only that, you're none of these things that I've mentioned. Everything is this whole big ultimate contradi- contradiction. And, f- and for your father, I hope I answered this question. Gosh. <laughs> well, I, I, yeah, I hope I hope his question was answered. But well, yeah, the way you yeah, live these, your life. Yeah. yeah, these are the uh, the changes, and also to the uh, I, I go out of my way. And I try to make no don- donations as much as much as possible. Donating to to women who have been abused, I do that. I part I partake in that. I, I partake in. Gosh, um, the list goes on of all the things I that I'm trying to do, and the, most of these things I have accomplished. And there's and there and there's and there are others, but right now I'm looking after. Um, Sounds like you're still working with youth. Others. Yeah, I'm still yeah. working with youth in That's my community, fantastic. but now I've, I've included uh, youth with uh, with uh, with disabilities, physical and intellectual disabilities. That's fantastic. Um, I have one question since you brought up the five senses that I was really curious about with the energy practice. Oh, well, energy. I didn't even talk about you. Yeah, right? <laughs> yeah, I think we got, I think I'm done this page. Yeah, yeah, I didn't even talk about energy. <laughs> but one thing I really wanted to know is if this is an audio based technology, is there any way that a deaf person would be able to uh, use energy maybe through still vib- work. vibrational? Yeah, it still work. Cause, okay. uh, cause uh, uh, low carrier frequencies are not based on the sound itself. Like it is a sound. Um, but when you get uh, below, at the 13 level of energy, because energy is 13 levels, at the 13 level, we're, exper- we're, we're using infrasound. So infrasound, you can't hear infrasound. It can, it can only be felt. All right? But even above mm. that, above the 20 hertz, um, you don't have to hear a binaural beat for it to work. It just has to, it's, it's based on f- force, it's based your on vibration. Your brain will still recognize Your brain it. will, uh, you're picking up, because it's... it's it has very little to do with the eardrum, in my opinion. It has to do with it stimulating your brainstem, mm-hmm. right? So that kind of vibration stimulates the brainstem. And when the brainstem is stimulated, just imagine what happens as the, sorry, I'm hitting the mic, but oh, as the brain, <laughs> the brainstem is being stimulated, all the other parts of the brain are being, is, is getting the after effect of that stimulation from the brainstem, right? So that you don't actually have to hear it. So even a, a deaf person can use the energy and still get the effects of it. Very cool. Yeah. Well, yeah, that was something that was definitely crossed my mind. I was like, will this work? Yeah, a lot but... of people, a lot of people ask that question. Okay. I, someone asked that question a week ago, two weeks ago, I should say. Yeah, but yeah. it still, it still works. His name is Michael, Michael Johnson. He asked me that. He was like, how can it work if it's, I was like, I think you're caught up in the, in the word, in the, in the term sound. And hearing. Yeah, yeah. That it has to be heard. It's like, binaural beats don't have to be heard. They just have to be felt. Hmm. Yeah. It's like very a vibration good. type of thing. It's a, um, yeah, it's a, so it, uh, brainwave entrainment is very interesting. It's a very basic thing. 
uh, but the effects that it has on the on the brain and the nervous system, especially with low carrier frequency, uh, the effects it has on the body. And I, I, what I should mention, what it does is uh, it. Uh, the reason why I'm able to have the experience that I'm having is because brainwave entrainment uh, produces whole brain thinking, which is whole brain functioning. So it allows the left and the uh, the left and the right hemisphere of the brain to synchronize with each other. So when a person is able to synchronize the two hemispheres of the brain, these type of experiences of oneness can happen. Hmm. Well, right? that kind of plays into stuff like mushrooms because uh, there's science that shows that that can create new neural pathways. New neural pathways between parts of between the brain the two that don't normally connect. That usually at all. don't communicate. Yeah, yeah. That's what I've always found very fascinating about it. Yeah. And this okay. was going to be done with brainwave entrainment. So through time with, with practice, um, the two hemispheres of the brain starts to communicate better with each other. So when, if, you're, if you're lucky enough to have one of these experiences I'm speaking of, it's because the two hemispheres of the brain are synchronizing. Mm. And that's what causes the oneness. But not only does it do that, is when you go out through your everyday life, which I should also add to what your father asked, um, I can sit down, I said this in the podcast before, I can sit down with a group of clan members and reason with them. People say, how can you ever, I'm like, I can do that. I've done this with murderers. You're like, look guys, I'll be the, I'll be the clown. <laughs> yeah, I'll, as long as I dress up as the clown. We're bringing it back, yeah, we're bringing it back full circle. Yeah, but I can do this. I can do this. I can sit, it doesn't mean I'm not going to be upset and not be offended by any of the, of the remarks that they have to make, but I can sit down with a group of people without any bias and, and reason with you. I've done this with murderers. I've done this with rapists. I've done this with so many groups of people. And I still keep myself, as I'm talking to you, I have less, I'm not saying there's no bias, but I have less bias. I can still see the beauty in you of what you're capable of. I can still see your potential. I can see, I can sell, see all of that. And I can see why you came out the way you did. And it's the character that you're playing. And it's the character you're probably supposed to play. And, but I can, I can see, I can walk in your footsteps. I have more empathy. I have more compassion. I can walk in your footsteps and see why you, you are the person that you are. And when I'm able to see that from that perspective, I have less, less judgment towards you. Well, and of course, a lot of people who end up doing really heinous things like that, if you look into their past, it's things that were inflicted on them when they were young and, and that can... There's that too. Yeah. Right? There's their, their environment. Yeah. Right? So it could be an abusive environment. It could just be an environment where you grew up in an area and you believed based on the, the influence of that environment the that it's us norms. versus them. Yeah. Yeah. Our, our group is more superior than the other group. Yeah. And if you grew up believing that, it's going to play a, a huge role in your in your everyday reality. And it, it makes sense. And so you're a victim of that. You've been conditioned. You've been yeah. conditioned, right? Mm. How can I hate you because you've been conditioned? How can I hate you because you're a victim of your, of your social conditioning? Well, all the more reason that I've always felt that uh, religious stuff should be sort of something that you approach once you are at a mature age and you say, hey, you know what? I want to learn about this, that or the other thing. And that indoctrination I've always found kind of messed up personally. I, it comes and, from and, a good place. Yeah. It's, it's and, like, and I agree. And I agree. Yet I also agree with the other side of that, too. That how do you how do you create culture? How do you? Right. So I get it on both sides. Well, and that's why that, that's yeah. why I always remain neutral <laughs> because I'm like, oh, man, I see your point of view. Yeah, and I see it clearly because there's things that uh, that bothered me throughout the years that I've gone through growing up in how I grew up. And I'm like, oh, I, I, I hate the fact that this was forced on me. I have Catholic guilt to this day and yeah, I'm not right? a Catholic. I've never been baptized. I wasn't Catholic <laughs> when I went to Catholic school. But you learn enough stories about Jesus and yeah. sinning and all this other all shit. All that stuff. You know? Right. Yeah. yeah. So it's like I'm at the point now, but at the same time, I say to myself, but if I didn't go through any of these experiences, maybe this thing that happened to me in, in uh, 2019, maybe it wouldn't have happened. Yeah. So I just have to accept all that happened. It is what it is. But the ending result was that. And now I can sit with anyone. Um, I still, don't get me wrong, I still have, there's conversations I have with people that they piss me off. Yeah. But as I'm being pissed off, the the, the, in, the empty self, the the, the empty witness watches it all happening. And I'm aware of the empty witness is watching it all happen as I'm reacting to whatever it is I'm reacting to. Whatever it gives it is you I'm a totally to. different perspective. Oh, it's, it's the greatest thing I've ever done. It's the greatest investment I've ever made to be able to see things from that perspective because this is where the less suffering comes in. I still suffer though. Yeah. I still go through stuff. I still have bad days. I still have whatever. I Just prior to having this, uh, this, this, this um, meeting with you, um, gosh, I went through, gosh, five weeks of mental torment <laughs> Based on what, if I can ask? I, I, I picked up my meditation practice where I said, I'm going to try to do four hours a day 
and see how long I see how I how long I can uh, I can uh, maintain this uh, before uh, I hit my threshold. And by the third week, I hit my threshold. <laughs> Four hours. I a stopped day and I went back to my. Investment. I went back. To, yeah, I went back to my one hour. But um, all the stuff started coming up, and uh, it was painful. It was mentally painful. But yet I still went to work every day. I did. I continued my meditation. Back to an hour every day. And still water. chopped wood, yeah. carry water, did all that stuff, and just waited for it to dissipate. And it all went his. It it it. it it's now at the minimal level of what I was feeling. And I'm back to normal, I think. Uh, last week, I went through a period, I wouldn't call it bliss, but I went through a period where I, everything just happened with ease. Like mm -hmm. like being in the flow state. Yeah, yeah, you yeah, hear about happened, that a lot. Yeah, it happened for about a few days, and now I'm just back to normal as whatever. And so, okay, good, I'm back to normal. I got to come down to Ottawa, do this thing. <laughs> I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, and I, I got it done, but yeah, for about a good four or five weeks. Are you in Ottawa just to do this? Yeah, yeah. I just came down just to do this. Oh, man. I appreciate that so yeah, much. I, I had no idea. I tried to stop over at my sister-in-law's house um, before coming here, uh, but it was it was too unexpected. So maybe I'll, maybe on I'll, the way I'll back. visit her on the way back. But yeah, I came here just to are do this. Are you leaving like tomorrow then? Or are you oh, no, I'm going to stay till I'm gonna stay till Sunday and then leave Sunday morning. Do you have any friends in the city? or I do, but I, I don't feel like looking them up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I do, though. I'm just like, eh. well, I have my other sister-in-law who's uh, who lives in Ottawa as well. Okay. Uh, she should be coming back from um, Winnipeg tomorrow. So if she comes back in time, we'll probably go see her as well. That makes me feel good. Yeah. I feel bad you drove all the way down uh, just to do this. Like, this uh, yeah, I day. promised you when you hit me up, I said, <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's in Ottawa. I said, yeah, I said, yeah. Yeah, I said, I'll do it. And I, I said, I said, you know, I'm going to keep my promise. I'll do it. So I just hopped, hopped in my vehicle and came all the way down. Well, no, that means the world to me. And uh, if it's any consolation, I am going to be working all overnight after this. <laughs> With, yeah, now we're almost at nine. There's no way I'm getting yeah, a nap. I'll, I'll make up for it. So. <laughs> but one thing I will recommend, um, I'm actually, why that's even crazier is I finish at 7 a.m. And then I'm going to be just Jeez. staying up. Yeah. Because uh, no sleep, only because tomorrow is the the great Glebe Garage sale. So that you, that you were telling me about earlier. Yeah, yes, this yes, entire yes. neighborhood, yeah. everybody puts out stuff, and there's you know music, and it's a great. If you have a chance, go check it out tomorrow. Oh yeah, okay, you might not be able okay. to find parking. That's about the only. That would thing. be the only thing, right? It's, uh, yeah, you just walk around and see so many interesting individuals. You probably buy some really cool stuff, yeah. and uh, yeah, great shops along the main stretch of Bank Street there. So oh, yeah. interesting. If you got tomorrow, what time does it start? It seven, like seven a.m. Seven a.m. Right? People get there early to get the good parking spots and try to yeah. snatch up all the stuff before it gets bought and so. it finishes when uh it, i think it kind of goes all day until okay. people feel like packing it in but pack it up okay yeah if you're really trying to find cool stuff you want to be there in the morning because okay. it gets bought up a lot of it yeah well it sounds like white people's version of caravana okay yeah, yeah i guess great. so <laughs> <laughs> yeah you can buy great. records you can buy clothes buy clothes you can, you can do all of that right yeah you'll okay. find cool stuff for sure like yeah. uh this know, happens every year yeah, once a year. It's always like uh, near the end of May. Yeah. It always ends up being beautiful weather too, which it looks like we're going to have tomorrow. So okay. Yeah, okay, maybe I'll see you there. Yeah. It's, po it's possible. It's possible. Well, there's a yeah. shit ton of people. I doubt we'll see yeah. each other, but who knows? The universe is funny like that. Maybe I know. Huh? We'll <laughs> each other. Um, I think that's it. I mean, oh no, I have one more question oh, I want to okay. ask that Shoot. I read, oh, which okay. I was kind of taken aback by and I'm kind of bummed out by because this stuff interests me and, and I would like to get more into meditating and exploring these, these avenues. But then I saw that apparently onions and garlic are frowned upon in uh, a lot of Buddhist teachings, which yeah. I had no idea. Yeah. And it's because it can cause some kind of distress, according to them? Yeah, because uh, everyone, of course, they have their theories, but um, uh, garlic and onion would be like a yang food. So from that standpoint, it can bring up certain types of aggressions within the body. But from, um, from a meditation standpoint, um, there's something in onions and uh, garlic that... Um, it doesn't, it speeds up the brain waves. It doesn't slow them down into the meditative states. Oh, so it's like, yeah. So it's, a, it's one of the things that you're supposed to stay away from. If you're a meditator, I still have, I, st I have, I have very little garlic, but I still have like cooked onions in my, in my food, but I try I to, I try shallots. to, yeah, it, like oh. these things are great. Right. So I try to, I just try to reduce them because it's kind of hard to just cut these things out of your diet. Just like that. I yeah. already cut out meat and fish and yeah. dairy and something. Yeah. I got to have something. Right. But um, yeah, well, I find but, it surprising too, because of all the times that I've heard garlic's and garlic and onions um, being really healthy in a lot oh, of yeah. ways. And Especially that, garlic, uh, right? All the garlic properties that it has. But I've heard yeah. the, this old wives tale that if you have like a really bad cold, you cut an onion and leave it out on your bed stand. And then in the morning, the onion will be all gnarly and that it's, it's supposed to, Maybe this is total bullshit, but that it's supposed to, to look extract into the uh, the bad the bad cold germs or whatever. I don't know. It probably is bullshit, but I'd have to look into it. It's an ancient um, kind of thing. What, I heard one about. thing I learned today: if you take the skin of onions and garlic and you boil them and you cool you cool the the, the water, you can use it as a spray 
repellent. So you can, uh, it stops um, uh, cockroaches and mosquitoes. Oh. Yeah, just from mixing things I guess they have pungent together. odors. That makes sense. Yeah. And you're supposed to spray this in the, the corners of your house. Okay. Yeah. So, like, there's so many things. That, I've many, heard mint also properties. has that effect that a lot of animals don't like mint. I heard that too. Yeah. I heard that as well. Yeah. So, so there's, there's so many things. But from a meditator standpoint, um, they probably speed up the the, the brain waves that uh, you may not want, unless you're trying to because it may speed up your brain waves into the beta area. The beta areas you don't really want that. You want the alpha, theta, delta, epsilon. Um, brain waves, and if you are going to go faster, you want the higher ones, such as gamma, hypergamma, and lambda. So these are the faster brain waves um, that scientists have picked up in the the, the brains of um, high, of um, advanced meditators. That these meditators are producing these brain waves. Um, what they found out with these uh, with these monks, um, the average person produces um, uh, uh, small small sparks of uh, gamma. So like if you bite into a fruit. You'll spark some gamma if you like having an orgasm you'll spark some gamma but what they found out with these with these monks they have they hold gamma in the brains majority of the times just like it's ever just like present. it's always ever present huh. right which is absolutely which is amazing because the average human being doesn't do that so yeah i would love one day if i uh, if i met with um, some scientists this is what i want to work on in the future i wanted them to examine my brain to see what's happening in my brain because there's certain things that i feel um, and I'd like to know what's actually happening with my brain waves because, um, back, uh, tw uh, 20, okay. I met those guys, the DMT guys. I met them in 2012. So I must've, yeah, I was doing a workshop with, uh, my participants in 2010. And I remember the moment where my brain waves changed. I remember the moment I fell into the brain, into a, a meditative state It stayed there ever since still there to this very day. I was, uh, doing the, the workshop and as I was given the lesson, I went, Oh shit. My brain went, something just changed in my, in my state, in my state of being. Wow. It's always been there. It's never changed. And it happened that moment. Uh, it was the Thursday afternoon, um, around four 30. This happened. It has always been there. And it happened again on the lower level. This happened in 2018. So this is like prior to, this is when I finished working with ayahuasca and prior to doing, working with five meal DMT, another shift happened. I was lying in bed. I, was, I finished work. I was lying in bed and, um, it was after six. I can't remember the day, but it was after six and I was lying there and another shift happened. Something changed. Um, but it wasn't like a meditative state. It was like a level of suffering disappeared. There was a, there was a, a heavy, there was a, an a bit of a burden that was still there for a period of time. I've always felt it. And I was never able to get deep enough to get rid of that thing that I was feeling. But in Exercise that moment, it kinda... yeah, it lifted. <laughs> and it's, it's, it's been there. It's been gone ever since, except for the moments when I'm having these, uh, these five weeks of, uh, of mental despair. But still, even, I've, even when I'm having that level of despair, that thing that I'm speaking of, that the level of the center of gravity it's, it's, it's never, it's never, I've never felt that, uh, that heavy feeling again. It's always been gone. So as I'm going through levels of, of despair, I'm this, the center of gravity is still the same hmm. where it's opened. It's, um, it's never reemerged in the way that it's it never reemerged the, as the way it was. It's, it's quite amazing. It's like really, really subtle things. And I usually forget about them. It's only when I'm talking to someone, I'm like, Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. But it, it, you get so used to them that, um, you just like, ah, and you just go about your day and you, and you look for the next thing. But in my case, since 2019, after I had the, the big blowout, I haven't searched for enlightenment after that. I continue to do my meditation because I just like doing it. But I have never searched for anything after that. I just always been, eh. <laughs> I experience everything I need to experience. But nothing more needs to happen. That makes but, sense. But I With continue my practice. Like, yeah, I, mean, I can so. still continue. I still continue my practice. And I still take, right now, I'm taking the graduate level for a integral theory. Because I finished, uh, after I had that experience, I did an 18-month course in regards to integral theory introduced by um, uh, uh, Ken Wilber. So now I'm in the, the graduate master's um, level right now. So it's only for like 12 weeks. And it starts tomorrow, actually. So even though I may come down and check the, the garage sale, yeah. if I do come down, I have to start my course uh, for the next 12 weeks. So I'm still working on the psychological stuff as a human being, the, the growing, which they call growing up. But in terms of waking up, I, you I, are welcome. I, yeah, I've done that. I've done that. So I'm just now working on my personal self, the the relative self, um, the stages of psychological change, so I can continue to make a and, and to make a a, 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 a a more of a difference in the world. So I'm I'm working on that. But states, waking states, I I I, I don't see anything higher than that. <laughs> and if there is, 
and it happens and i accept that too uh, but yeah i i stopped after that day the search stopped for me yeah, you seem like someone who is very content you you, you give off but even that, that wouldn't matter i could be ah, and still the 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 empty witness is watching it all happen. That's why it's really hard to tell because it's hard for me to fully understand. Yeah, as much as I get yeah, what you're saying. From the, from the Western perspective, we look for certain cues on the person to say, "Okay, that person is there because they're they're more content and whatever." From my eyes, are like that doesn't. You can be content <laughs> and all that stuff and not be and not and not be there. So so the empty self can be within the body that's very that's really erratic or whatever the case Strat. is, and still. Um, that person could be awake and it's just the physical body or the, 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 the psyche of the person could be off. Hmm. Yeah. It's, it's a very interesting one, but that's not how we see it. We look for certain cues, but I'm just like, I've, I've met so many types of people and, um, and people who I've worked with and shamans and, and, uh, teachers, spiritual teachers. And some of these guys are off, but the things that they're able to do. Oh, sure, I, I I can have I can have my opinion on that. I can have my doubts, and I can have my I can be a little, um, you know, hesitant, hesitant, or whatever the case is. But um, I've met all types of beings, and I've met people who I know they're awakened, but they're still kind of fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> they just have a thing that they've achieved over everyone else, but they still they still have other things that they need to work on. I still have things I have to work on, and uh, and the list goes on. So that that process I don't think ever ends. Well, it's good to have that insight for sure moving forward. Yeah. The moment I say, oh, it's over, it's stopped, whatever, that's where you got me. That's where the trap is. Yeah. Right? I have to always keep in mind that there's still more to work on, especially as a human being. I may have done this on a, on a state level where I've reached the highest state of non-dual reality, but as a human being, I still, I still have to be a, a better friend and learn how to be a better And you're going to continue to be and, presented and with new challenges. be presented with new challenges and, and all that stuff, right? Yeah. So my job is to... Is to try to integrate them and, and, and death will be the ultimate challenge. Death I will be the ultimate. Well, or <laughs> <laughs> there's more levels after that. Yeah, right? I don't know so. if we have another three hours. <laughs> death. <laughs> or, yeah. yeah it, I don't think it ever ends. Right. So, yeah. Well, to say that this has been enlightening and fascinating would be a massive understatement, <laughs> uh, but we, we do have to wrap it up. Unfortunately, oh, yeah. um, I am going to ask you though, the question I've been asking everybody this season, which has nothing to do with any of this. I don't think depending on what your answer is, but <laughs> what is the shittiest job you've ever had? The job I have now. <laughs> <laughs> you just know how to process it. Yeah, I know how okay. to process it. Yeah. It could be a shady job sometimes, but no, but do you yeah. have any that stands out from your youth or someplace you just absolutely loathe? The worst Maybe a job boss that you just couldn't stand or. Oh, I've had many of those. <laughs> Haven't I, we all? I, yeah. I had a job. I had a job. Oh gosh. This was one of these under the table jobs. Um, they, they, some, a bus comes and picks you up. This is when I was an amateur, when I was an amateur comic and a bus comes and picks you up and then they bring you to this place and you're working with sharp metals and they're greasy. Oh my what gosh. It was this brutal. Place? It was, like I, I don't even know what, or something? I think they shipped me to a third world country and brought me back. <laughs> I don't know what they did. It was, this job was brutal, man. And then the uh, bus will drop you off at, a, at a, some secret location and it will, uh, they just give you cash and then they send you on your way and you meet them again the next morning. I, I was, was able to do this labor, for a week like... and I quit. I said, I can't do this shit anymore. <laughs> wow. Yeah. It was a that terrible job. Super sketchy. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I, but I, I, I ended up in a job like that for, for a sh very short period of time. That was probably one of the worst jobs i've ever i still don't understand what you were doing you were sorting i was sorting out sharp metals i don't know what that <laughs> sounds like definitely a shitty job i think they were building a bomb i don't know what they were doing oh but my god <laughs> yeah but it was some it was like a really really a terrible shitty job and but it paid um, the bills at the time i guess at, i needed at the time as, as an amateur comic not getting paid um uh at that time shortly after ended up working at kfc part-time as in, in the call center for the next four years until things picked up. Wait, the KFC call center? Yeah, the KFC call center. Back in the day. <laughs> I thought KFC would be bad enough, but yeah. <laughs> you know what? It, because it's so repetitive, it, it got to me. But I did it for four years part-time. Uh, it got to the point where... What does a KFC call center agent deal with? Like people being like, yeah, hey, my chicken wasn't cooked enough. Like that kind of shit? Like you get that. Or that you someone screwed up my order. Okay. That type of stuff, right? Trying to get a discount or a coupon yeah. for next time. And you had to give up the discounts and stuff like that. But, um, but I was the voice for KFC's... Uh, um, call center, um, delivery call center message. So if you call KFC, uh, hello, this is KFC. Thank you for calling KFC home delivery. That was my voice. <laughs> uh, they kept my voice on and after, and when we made it, you know, Canadian big on buzz, they kept it. 
They was like, yo, <laughs> we got Mr. Mo on the mic royalties. here. Yeah, so they kept they kept my um, recording for, for years after that. Yeah, until, wow. yeah, until, because even after, like, years you they later, didn't. they never paid me a cent. You got, <laughs> you got clucked. I, I had to throw a chicken I know, pun in there. Yeah, throw a chicken. It wasn't that good. <laughs> but yeah, but, uh, yeah, but, um, uh, but the people there were great. The people were there were great. Um, but yeah, uh, some of the people I still talk to to this very day. But, uh, but, um, did you yeah. ever get the Colonel Secret recipe or never, <laughs> never? But, it, but, it's, um, you can't it, find that online anywhere now. You would think in this day and age that it would ask AI. Now. Oh, yeah, AI Ooh, should have the answer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's a, G- a chat GTP we got to do. <laughs> ask AI, it'll, it'll give it to you. <laughs> oh, damn. Yeah, I'm gonna do that honestly after this podcast. <laughs> All right, well, this was an absolute blast, and thank you again so much for making the oh, trek out here, man. I really appreciate for spending me. this time with you. Thank you. This was super cool. Oh, thank we you. always high five at the end. <laughs> cool. Yeah, some people's going to think this is absolutely nuts, but that's my life. Yeah, I, you presented <laughs> in a very grounded way, though. I got to say that because even coming into this interview, I didn't know fully what to expect. I knew I liked you from the buzz or from buzz. I'm going to keep saying the buzz. <laughs> the buzz and the book. I was enjoying. I like. I've made it through. I think almost half, and and it was very interesting stuff. But I still didn't know how you were going to be once you got on the mic. And I have to say, really, considering the stuff you're talking about, I found, yeah, you do sound very grounded and not like a whack job, basically. Yeah. You know oh, what yeah. I mean? I you still know, do my thing. Some and giant the beard. Like, yeah. Yeah, man. Hey, guys, trying to float on some thin air. Some guy from a Grateful yeah. Dead concert or something. Yeah. That's, you know. None of that's happened. So no. like, if I don't say anything to anyone, people wouldn't even, wouldn't even notice. No, and I yeah. think the scientific aspects of this are very interesting, too, and how they weave in with the spiritual. It's very cool. Oh, yeah. They're all connected. It's all the one thing. So, so I don't deny some science or spirituality i think they're all part of the same thing and um and it brings it gives it more juice when you explore it and you explore both That's yeah well, I find. you're yeah. like the definition of an open-minded person as far as i can <laughs> tell so in a good way though i mean that yeah. in the best way and well, now i just got to uh keep trying to reach one of those four-hour orgasms <laughs> <laughs> did i send you the meditation uh, I think it was in the book. There was a link I found. Oh, I'll, I'll send it to you. I'll yeah, send it to you. I'd like to, because I went on yeah. Google and I saw some of your videos where yeah. it would say now in session and, and all that, I right? listened to some yeah, of those. I'll yeah. send it to you. I thought I, I already, I thought I already sent it to you. I did find it very relaxing. I have to say, even uh, earlier today, I was listening to one and as someone who hasn't meditated it probably in years now at this point, I just kind of closed my eyes and got into it. And I did find it very hard to kind of open my eyes and come out of it. <laughs> I was very much in a lulled state, you know? Yeah. So I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to listen to some more and I appreciate you coming, man. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Thanks everybody for watching.